crew of Endeavor was awakened by Mission Control to a song from the movie Top Gun in tribute to Shuttle Commander Kent Rominger and the flying skills required for the day's docking of the shuttle to the International Space Station. Excellent choice for a Rommel rendezvous day. And as you know, your absolute speed is going to be 25,000 kilometers an hour. But Rommel, you'll finesse it relative to station at less than one half inch per second. There's no question that you're going to be top gun for the planet today. And that makes a great day. Enjoy the rendezvous profile. Hey, good morning, Houston. Uh, thank you, Steve. Great motivational music for me this morning as long as the words. Rominger got started on the day's rendezvous activities, assisted by pilot Jeff Ashby and mission specialist Scott Parazinski and Chris Hadfield. Later, Rominger executed the terminal initiation burn, starting the shuttle on course to close the final few miles to the space station. As they got closer, Rominger took a moment to greet Space Station Expedition 2 crew member Jim Voss. So we were just calling to give you an update, Jim. Uh, we're 22,000 feet away. You guys are clearly visible night as well as daytime, and you're in a beautiful machine. When Endeavour reached a point directly below the station, at a distance of about 600 feet, Rominger moved to the aft flight deck and took manual control of his ship, flying a quarter-circle arc in front of ISS. He held position there until Mission Control relayed word that the station's solar arrays were locked in a proper position for docking. The SM and FGB arrays are feathered. You have a go for V-bar approach and go for docking. Copy, go for docking. Rominger pulsed Endeavour's jets and approached the station's docking port on the front end of the Destiny module at a rate of about a tenth of a foot per second. The shuttle closed in to the station and achieved contact and capture of the orbiting outpost. After completing leak and pressure checks, Endeavour's crew opened the hatch to the hallway between the shuttle and the station to retrieve supplies left by the station crew and drop off materials for the ISS residents. The crews cannot meet face to face until after Sunday's spacewalk due to the difference in air pressure between the vehicles. The Endeavour crew brought the supplies back into the shuttle's mid-deck and began preparations for the spacewalk to attach the new robot arm, called Canadarm2, to the station. The arm is essential to all future construction of the outpost. After finishing preparations and making final checks of their equipment, the crew got ready for bed, looking forward to the next day's work outside the International Space Station. Aufnahmen aus der Endeavour während des Manövers. War schon das zielgenaue Bremsen äußerst kompliziert, wartet nun eine der schwierigsten Aufgaben auf das internationale Astronautenteam. Die Montage des mitgebrachten 18 Meter langen Krans. Dort des Shuttles befindet sich ein Versorgungsmodul und ein 18 Meter langer Kranarm. Für dessen Installation an der Außenwand wird die Crew dreimal außerhalb der Station arbeiten müssen. Close and personal. The U.S. shuttle Endeavour has docked with the International Space Station. Endeavour Commander Kent Rominger edged his craft into contact with the station more than an hour ago. Two astronauts will take their first walk on Sunday. They'll begin hoisting a Canadian-built robot arm onto the space station. It's intended to act as a construction crane to help add additional pieces to the orbiting outpost. And also up there, some NASA satellites appearing down on Mother Earth. Operating some 700 kilometers above the Earth, the satellites are sending some remarkable images from around the world. Among them, zooming in on the famous Hollywood sign in Southern California. Das Manöver, 300 Kilometer über dem Pazifik, verlief reibungslos. Endeavour hat unter anderem einen fast 18 Meter langen Roboterarm im Gepäck, der an der Außenseite der Raumstation montiert werden soll. Mit diesem Gerät sind Reparaturen an jeder Stelle der Raumstation möglich. Acht Tage lang bleibt Endeavour angekoppelt. Das erste Treffen der beiden Besatzungen ist für Montag geplant. Währenddessen funkte das Space Shuttle eindrucksvolle Bilder zur Erde. Mit aufwendiger Computertechnologie machte die NASA Aufnahmen von amerikanischen Großstädten und Sehenswürdigkeiten. Erlaubt heute Morgen im Londoner Hyde Park. Bei eiskaltem Aprilwetter formierten sich die Elitesoldaten der Königin um ihrer Majestät an ihrem echten, aber inoffiziellen Geburtstag 
zumindest 41 Salutschüsse abzufeuern. Denn die Königin zog es vor, fernab von allem Trubel durch den Park von Schloss Windsor zu reiten. Dies ist eine ältere Aufnahme. Auch heute Abend will sie nur mit ihrem Mann Prinz Philipp, der Königin Mutter und ihrer Schwester Margaret dinieren. Denn manches in diesem Jahr hatte sie not amused, zum Beispiel die taktlosen Äußerungen ihrer Schwiegertochter Sophie und die darauffolgende Diskussion über die Zukunft der Monarchie. Immerhin feiern sie heute wenigstens die konservativen Blätter mit langen Fotostrecken und liebevollen Essays. Und die Londoner selbst? Ich denke, dass die Monarchie bleibt und es keinen Grund gibt, dass wir eine Republik werden. Wir brauchen die königliche Familie. Und sie sind gut für unser Land. Mit ihrer vier Jahre jüngeren Schwester Margaret erlebte Elisabeth eine unbeschwerte Kindheit. Die ersten Pflichten kommen mit 16 und mit 26 Jahren ist sie Königin. Ein halbes Jahrhundert hat sie bald hinter sich pflichtbewusst und stets gelassen. Die Menschen, sie danken es ihr. 70 Prozent der britischen Bevölkerung wollen, dass die Monarchie bleibt. 20 Prozent sind Republikaner und wollen sie loshaben. 10 Prozent haben keine Meinung dazu und das hat sich in 30 Jahren nicht geändert. Es hat ja auch was, der ganze Pomp und die königliche Pracht. Kein Wunder, wenn viele Völker die Briten um ihre Königin beneiden. What we're seeing now are decisions not to uh, cancel things that the past administration did. When this administration starts taking its own initiatives, when it starts acting on the public lands in a way that we feel that they truly care about conservation, then we'll believe them. Environmentalists are smarting from actions taken earlier in the administration, like reneging on a campaign pledge to regulate carbon dioxide pollution from coal-burning power plants and virtually abandoning the Kyoto Treaty aimed at curbing global warming. There's also continued wavering on protecting unlogged areas of the national forests and an ongoing push to open up the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge for oil and gas drilling. I sense a real attack here. It may be good short-term politics because they're serving the oil industry or they're serving big business, but in the long term, the American people care about the stewardship of this planet. President Bush's supporters say he's bringing needed balance to environmental policy after an administration they say was far too eager to rely on the heavy hand of federal regulation. I think spring's coming. We're having spring cleaning now of the regulatory state. Now that's what's new in town. We've got some mature people in charge and we've got some grown-ups in charge and we're going to approach this on a, on a mature basis based on what's good overall for this country. While green groups still stand shoulder to shoulder in their criticism of the administration, some admit to an ironic silver lining, an increase in membership and donations. But they say these gains have been bought at too high a cost. Natalie Pavelski, CNN, Washington. Powered off now to conserve electricity. Also, in preparation for tomorrow's space walk by Chris Hadfield and Scott Perzinski, who are in the center of your picture here. Happy, thank you for all that. Her is uh, now uh, transferring early transfer items. Es hat eine dramatische Rettungsaktion begonnen. Einer der 50 Wissenschaftler der Amundsen-Scott-Forschungsstation ist lebensgefährlich erkrankt. Überleben kann er nur, wenn er schnell in ein Krankenhaus ausgeflogen wird. Seit gestern sind nun zwei Propellermaschinen von Chile aus auf dem Weg ins ewige Eis. 
Lisa Eberl mit den Einzelheiten. Das ist der Blick aus der Propellermaschine in Richtung Südpol. Irgendwo hier über dem ewigen Eis ist das Rettungsteam in diesem Moment unterwegs und versucht bei starken Winden und Temperaturen bis minus 75 Grad Kurs zu halten auf die Amundsen Scott Forschungsstation. Dort wartet der todkranke Ronald Schiminski auf seine Rettung. Seit einer plötzlichen Gallenkolik hat sich seine Bauchspeicheldrüse lebensgefährlich entzündet. Nur eine Operation kann den einzigen Arzt unter den 50 Wissenschaftlern der Polarstation retten. Gestern hat sich das Ärzteteam in Chile für den Abflug bereit gemacht. Mit an Bord die Ärztin, die Schiminski am Südpol ersetzen soll. Ich hatte kurz Zeit, um über das Risiko dieses Fluges nachzudenken, aber ich vertraue diesem Team und ich glaube, ich habe mehr Angst vorm Autofahren. Das Team startete gestern von Punta Arenas an der Südspitze Chiles und flog fünf Stunden zur britischen Basis nach Rothera. Jetzt gerade sind sie auf ihrem zehnstündigen Flug zur Südpolstation. Keiner weiß im Moment, ob die Landung auf Eis und bei Dunkelheit funktionieren wird. Vor zwei Jahren war die riskante Aktion schon einmal durchgeführt worden. Damals war ausgerechnet die Vorgängerin von Schiminski, die Ärztin Jerry Nielsen, an Brustkrebs erkrankt. Monatelang behandelte sie sich selbst, bis sie schließlich ausgeflogen werden konnte. Sie konnte den Krebs besiegen. Wenn die Landung heute glückt, dann könnte auch Ronald Schiminski schon übermorgen durch eine Operation gerettet werden. And it's not the work that I mind so much Or the long cold miles from my lover's touch No, for sure she's far away No stranger I to the touch of steel Or the honest fear any man can feel But I long for dust under my heels And a pocket full of pay So I'll take it from day to day Back ice round us cracks and groans The old St. Rock she creeps and moans The icy fog is in my bones And the ache won't go away Outside I bet it's warm and fair I could have her fingers in my hair But it's long cold miles to her out there So I guess I'll have to stay And just take it from day to day We're as far north now as I want to come But Larson's got us under his thumb And I signed up for the whole damn run I can't get off halfway But when I get back onto the shore I'm going south where it stays warm And there'll be someone on my arm To help me spend my pay So I'll take it from day Good morning, Endeavor. Stan Rogers from Canada singing Take It From Day To Day with all the parallels of another symbol of hope, the old Canadian ship, Le Saint Rock. And welcome to the Olympics in space. We are going to make you all honorary Canadians with Chris carrying the flag into the stadium today. For four years, you've been training long hours day to day, but today is the day. And from the edge of our seats on the ground, we will be with you as our proud heritage unfolds our future to christen Canada's place in space. And on behalf of those who want to follow, thank you for carrying the dream day to day. Thank you. That was a great piece of music to wake up to. Stan wrote some great music about exploring and about exploring Canada. on to the space station with it was a great way to wake up this is mission control houston this is a live television view from a camera on board the space shuttle endeavor uh, this a view of uh, one of the latches that holds the shuttle's robotic arm in place as uh, the robotic arm is powered up and uh, 
removed from its cradle on the left-hand edge of the payload bay. Uh, those latches being released now. That uh, in preparation for the use of that arm today to install its next generation cousin, uh, the Canada Arm 2 on the International Space Station. Uh, the arm will be used to lift the Space Lab pallet that holds that uh, new arm, the Canada Arm 2, out of the payload bay of the shuttle and uh, maneuver it in place to uh, latch it to a cradle on the station's destiny laboratory. That uh, work must be completed before astronauts uh, Chris Hadfield and Scott Perzinski begin a six and a half hour spacewalk then to uh, unfold the arm, uh, hook up power data and video cables, and uh, prepare it for its first control and uh, operation from within the space station. Endeavor Houston for RMS. We'd like step six of the RMS power up done. Ashby's now uh, maneuvering the shuttle's robotic arm down into place to uh, latch on to the pallet's fixture. This is the two spacecraft to fly 244 miles above the southern Pacific Ocean, uh, just a few hundred miles off the Chilean coast of South America. This is Mission Control Houston. This is an image uh, from a camera mounted at the midway point of the shuttle's robotic arm showing the uh, Space Lab pallet holding the Canada Arm 2 above the payload bay of the shuttle. Pilot uh, Jeff Ashby, assisted by European Space Agency astronaut Umberto Guidoni, are working uh, with the shuttle's robotic arm, maneuvering that pallet uh, above the payload bay and into a position where it will be latched to the International Space Station. The two spacecraft are currently above Central Africa. The pallet uh, holds the folded Canada Arm 2, the next generation robotic arm that will be attached to the International Space Station during the uh, six and a half hour spacewalk or unfolded uh, during the six and a half hour spacewalk upcoming by astronauts Chris Hadfield and Scott Perzinski this morning and also a UHF antenna that will be installed by Hadfield and Perzinski. This is a live television view from a camera aboard the Shuttle Endeavour as uh, pilot uh, Jeff Ashby continues to maneuver uh, Endeavour's robotic arm uh, with the uh, space lab pallet attached into position to attach the pallet to a latch on a uh, lab cradle assembly on the uh, Destiny Laboratory module's exterior of the International Space Station. This is Mission Control Houston as we watch a uh, television picture from Endeavour uh, showing uh, the shuttle's robotic arm uh, with the space lab pallet attached. Position 4 is partially open. We obviously need to modify the procedure a little bit, but uh, we'll get you words very shortly on where we would like it. Okay, uh, step 1.1 1 .1 is complete. I did close the supply crossover shutoff valve. 
This is Mission Control Houston, this live television picture showing uh, the connection drawing ever closer uh, for the Space Lab pallet to attach it to the exterior of the Destiny Laboratory. The bar on the pallet around which a latch on the laboratory's cradle will actually close is clearly visible in this view uh, at the center of the screen. Uh, around that bar, a latch on the station's cradle will be closed to secure the pallet in place uh, for the following work this morning uh, to set up the Canada Arm 2 and install a UHF antenna that work to be performed by Canadian Space Agency astronaut Chris Hadfield and uh, astronaut Scott Perzinski during a planned six and a half hour spacewalk. Everything on track uh, for a start of that spacewalk around 6.21 a.m. Central this morning. This is Mission Control Houston. Uh, Again, with the uh, Space Lab pallet successfully uh, latched to the exterior of the International Space Station's Destiny Laboratory. We would like you to inhibit the FDIR status. Thank you. We copy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is a live television view now from a uh, camera aboard Endeavour uh, looking at the uh, shuttle's robotic arm, the arm poised just above the uh, airlock. just above the hatch uh, from which Chris Hadfield and Scott Perzinski uh, will exit to begin their six and a half hours of work in space. Six and a half hours planned to attach a new generation of space robotics to the International Space Station, the uh, Canada Arm 2. And uh, this a uh, still image as uh, Chris Hadfield exits uh, the airlock of Endeavour, that occurring just a uh, minute ago. Endeavour above the Atlantic Ocean at the time at an altitude of 240 miles just off the uh, coast of Brazil. This is Mission Control Houston as uh, astronauts Chris Hadfield and Scott Perzinski uh, complete the installation of a UHF antenna to the exterior of the Destiny lab. Uh, inside Destiny, astronaut Susan Helms uh, just uh, radioed that she was now at the step where she's uh, turning on Keep Alive power to the uh, Canada Arm 2. In the boom. Okay. Look at 
that. Yeah, I'm about to engage the zip net. There it goes. Launch it again. Great. Perfect. All right. Looks good. Right where we wanted it. Pilot Jeff Ashby is maneuvering Chris Hadfield uh, back to the Space Lab pallet where the Canada Arm 2 is located. Okay. Ashby's at the controls of the shuttle's robotic arm, uh, working uh, them from the aft flight deck of Endeavour. The uh, three uh, Canada Arm 2s are now engaged with the John, we have two good strings of Keep Alive Power on the SSRMS. You have a go for deploy. That's great news, Ellen. Thanks. That is indeed. Good to hear. And Chris, can you verify that you close the flaps on all the bolts? We're doing that now. Okay, next. Hey, stop, Jeff. Stop. Good looking quiver, Scott. Thanks, yeah. This is a live television view of Chris Hadfield at work as he continues removing the super bolts, the launch restraint bolts for the Canada Arm 2. Yes, sir. Okay. It should be the tightest of the three. Okay, Jeff, just work our way down towards my feet, please. Coming down. We are clear. Stop. Scott Perzinski is uh, securing the bolts, all eight of which have been removed now. 30.5 for about five turns, John. Ah, uh, correct, Scott. About to uh, close the cover on the quiver where those bolts were installed, uh, secure for the trip home aboard the Space Lab pallet. All the uh, eight super bolts, uh, yard-long bolts that held the arm in place during its launch have been removed now. Okay, I guess I go to egress. Huh? Next step in the process is uh, to initial, initially raise the boom, the still folded boom of the arm, that in preparation for its unfolding, which will follow uh, that uh, initial raise. Unfolding uh, the arm will uh, proceed very slowly. It's designed to not occur uh, faster than about one degree per second. Uh, the arm's unfolded a full 180 degrees, so it'll take a minimum of three minutes to fully unfold the arm. It uh, may actually be done much slower than that. What folded? Not just for my here. Here we go. Don't you have a question for that good motion? Uh, no, I didn't, Scott. Okay. Hadfield uh, holding the arm now as pilot Jeff Ashby of Endeavour begins uh, lifting to unfold it. One degree a second, I think, is what we're charging into the eddy current damper. Endeavour and the International Space Station are 238 miles above the mid Atlantic Ocean. Coming real nice, Jeff. Perfect. Unfolded, the uh, Canada Arm 2 uh, measures about uh, 25 feet in length. Once uh, it's in use uh, with uh, the booms uh, operating and the elbow joint fully extended, it uh, measures as much as uh, 58 feet in length, almost 58 feet. What an absolutely spectacular view.
the uh, Canada Arm 2. Unfolding, unfolding a new era in space robotics uh, with the uh, Endeavour below as the two sail 240 miles above the Atlantic Ocean. And now okay, the final one is B outboard upper. This is a, a view of the uh, hinged booms, the expandable diameter fasteners being put in place by uh, Scott Perzinski. Okay, awesome. And um, we need you to, the next step is to route safety tether under the F3 APFR and then ingress. And there. And for Chris, install the upper. Uh, With the, uh, the fasteners pushed in, now uh, Perzinski will use a uh, power tool to tighten them. By the way, uh, Chris, your helmet cam view of the PGT looks like out of a training film. That's a perfect view there. <laughs> we are uh, four hours and 58 minutes, almost five hours into this planned six and a half hour spacewalk as the Spatial Endeavor and the International Space Station or about 239 statute miles above the Caribbean. Right now, the Space Shuttle on Space Station orbiting 240 statute miles over the east coast of the United States, uh, preparing to cross over the Canadian border. Endeavour, we wondered if we could have the minicam view for downlink, the overhead window. I think you'll like this. It's uh, Roger, Roger Doucette singing at the Forum in Montreal before a hockey game.
Chris and Scott. We're real proud of your work up there, getting Kennedy Arm 2 operational. And if you look, if you turn around and look down, I believe you're right over Newfoundland. We are here. We're coming over the uh, Avalon Peninsula. St. John's, where my brother lives there, and Steve, uh, it's hands in both the ship to the spot. Canada, thank you very much for all the people who helped put the arm up here. Scott and I were just the delivery men, and it really just opens the door to what all of us can be doing together here internationally, beginning to explore space, space as a planet. And some kind of the fat part. Thank you. Zwei Astronauten der US-Raumfähre Endeavour haben am Nachmittag damit begonnen, den neuen Roboterarm an der internationalen Raumstation ISS zu montieren. Der fast 18 Meter lange Arm wurde vorher von dem Roboter des Shuttle aus der Ladebucht gehoben und dann an seinen Platz manövriert. Rund sechseinhalb Stunden soll der Weltraumspaziergang dauern. Die Endeavour hatte gestern an der ISS angedockt. Canadian and US astronauts from the shuttle Endeavour have begun a spacewalk with the aim of installing a robot arm on the International Space Station. The 17 meter long arm is capable of lifting station components into place. Canadian Chris Hadfield says leaving the airlock for the spacewalk, spacewalk was quote, like a chicken coming out of an egg. The two astronauts also installed an antenna. The device will enable the station crew to talk to spacewalkers and also improve communication with the space shuttle. Der knapp 18 Meter lange und 2 Millionen Mark teure Arm soll Außenarbeiten an der ISS übernehmen und damit die Zahl der riskanten Ausstiege verringern. Planmäßig werden die Astronauten noch weitere zweieinhalb Stunden im All arbeiten. Die japanischen Raumfähre Endeavour sind für rund sechseinhalb Stunden in den Weltraum ausgestiegen, um einen Roboterarm an die internationale Raumstation anzuschließen. Die Astronauten stellten die nötigen Stromverbindungen zwischen Raumstation und Arm her. Außerdem soll das Team eine Hochfrequenzantenne montieren. Sie soll den Kontakt zwischen der ISS-Station und den Arbeitern im All herstellen. Bis heute von der Raumfähre Endeavour. Zwei Astronauten machten den ersten Weltraumspaziergang. Allerdings war der mit Arbeit verbunden. Sie montierten einen Greifarm und eine Antenne an die Raumstation ISS. Erst gestern hatte die Raumfähre Endeavour an die Raumstation angedockt. Acht Tage lang dauert der Besuch. Und morgen werden sich die beiden Besatzungen zum ersten Mal treffen. Aus der Raumfähre Endeavour ausgestiegen, um einen Roboterarm an der ISS anzubringen. Der 18 Meter lange Ausleger ist der größte Beitrag der Kanadier zur internationalen Raumstation und soll an jeder Stelle der ISS Arbeiten ausführen können. Es ist der 19. Weltraumspaziergang beim Bau der Orbitalstation. Die Astronauten der amerikanischen Raumfähre Endeavour haben mit der Montage eines neuen Roboterarms an der internationalen Raumstation ISS begonnen. Sie stiegen für rund sechseinhalb Stunden in den Weltraum aus, um den Arm an Elektrokabeln anzuschließen. Er wurde vorher von einem Roboter des Shuttle aus der Ladebucht geholt und an seinen Platz manövriert. Während des Ausstiegs wollen die Astronauten auch eine Hochfrequenzantenne anbringen. Sie soll den Kontakt zwischen der ISS-Station und den Spaziergängen im All herstellen. Seit Stunden arbeiten ein Amerikaner und ein Kanadier an der Außenhülle der Internationalen Raumstation ISS. In der Schwerelosigkeit montieren sie einen Greifarm, den sie gestern mit der Raumfähre Endeavour zur ISS gebracht hatten. Und obwohl es bereits der 63. Weltraumspaziergang in der Geschichte ist, bleibt doch ein gewisser Nervenkitzel. Der Sonntagsspaziergang der beiden Astronauten dauert sechseinhalb Stunden und ist alles andere als entspannend. Bei ihrem hochkomplizierten Manöver installieren sie den Roboterarm, indem sie ihn zunächst durch Elektrokabel mit der Internationalen Raumstation verbinden. Entwickelt wurde der 18 Meter lange und 2 Milliarden Mark teure Arm von kanadischen Wissenschaftlern. Der Roboter ist in der Lage, tonnenschwere Module zu bewegen und soll für Reparaturen eingesetzt werden. Risikoreiche Ausstiege von Astronauten können dadurch reduziert werden. 
Der Arm hat zwei Hände, an jedem Ende eine. Dadurch kann er sich bewegen wie ein Wurm. Mit einer Hand hält er sich fest und mit der anderen kann er arbeiten. In der kommenden Woche werden die Astronauten noch eine Hochfrequenzantenne installieren, die die Kommunikation zwischen der Station und den Spaziergängern im All verbessern soll. Und bereits am Montag besuchen sie die Besatzung der Internationalen Raumstation. Neben mehreren Tonnen Ausrüstungsmaterial haben sie auch Überraschungen im Gepäck. Parmesankäse, eine Verdi-CD und eine Botschaft vom Papst. Unten montieren zwei Astronauten im All einen Roboterarm an die internationale Raumstation ISS. Der knapp 18 Meter lange Arm soll Außenarbeiten an der ISS übernehmen und damit die Zahl der riskanten Ausstiege verringern. Es ist der 63. Weltraumspaziergang in der Geschichte der Raumfahrt, der 19. im Dienste der Internationalen Raumstation ISS und der erste für einen Kanadier. Chris Hatfield und sein US-Kollege Scott Parasinski werden ihren sechseinhalbstündigen Ausflug ins All in wenigen Minuten beenden. Der 900 Millionen Dollar teure Roboterarm würde auf der Erde mehr als 1600 Kilogramm wiegen und wäre instabil. Nicht so im Weltraum, wo er den Astronauten in Zukunft helfen soll, Arbeiten an jeder Stelle der Raumstation durchführen zu können. Dazu wird der Greifarm später auf einer Art Schlitten an der Außenwand entlang gleiten. Bedient wird er mit einem Computer aus der ISS. Außerdem brachten die beiden Astronauten eine Hochfrequenzantenne an, die zukünftig den Kontakt zwischen der Raumstation, den ankommenden Shuttles sowie zwischen künftigen Raumspaziergängern und dem Kontrollraum auf der Erde verbessern helfen soll. Für morgen ist das erste Treffen zwischen der Endeavour-Besatzung und den Astronauten der ISS geplant, die seit Mitte März in der Raumstation leben. Around Sunday, so to speak, he became the first person from his country to walk in space. Hadfield's first words up there, oh man, what a view. Hadfield and his US counterpart will connect a massive Canadian-built robotic arm to the International Space Station. Once that arm is functional, the billion-dollar arm will help install a pressure chamber in the space station. Welcome back. He was a Soviet national hero. Forty years ago, Yuri Gagarin became the first man to venture into space. But as Jill Doherty reports, these days, Gagarin's historic mission doesn't always inspire the national pride it once did. 40 years ago, on a windswept launch pad in Kazakhstan, Yuri Gagarin climbed aboard a Vostok 1 rocket. At 9.07 a.m., he shouted, Payekhali, let's go, and blasted off into history. The first man ever to enter space. He was 27 years old. Gravitational force increasing. There's vibration. I feel fine. Mood is buoyant. I'm looking through the window. I can see Earth. Gagarin's flight lasted just one hour and 48 minutes, one brief orbit around the Earth. He returned a hero, the perfect Soviet man. Russian school children memorized his biography. But Gagarin's attraction went beyond medals and glory. Yuri drew people to him with his simplicity, his easy way of dealing with you. He was very communicative, his smile. When you saw him smile, he just had to smile back. Yuri Gagarin never returned to space. Seven years later, he was killed in a routine jet flight. The cause of that crash is still a mystery. As Russians celebrate the anniversary of Gagarin's flight, some of them, like Antonina, a retired factory worker, still feel the emotion of that day. I love Gagarin very much. He was brave and determined, and I admire him because he was a Russian man, a hero. But Ruslan says Gagarin has never been a hero for him. They used to tell us, if you study hard, you'll become a cosmonaut. It was really silly. Any one of us could have been the first man in space. I don't think there are any heroes in Russia now, says Olga, especially for young people. Forty years ago, some young Russians celebrating Gagarin's return held up a sign. We believed in this, it said. Today in Russia, 
such faith is hard to find. Jill Doherty, CNN, Moscow. Well, times have certainly changed since that first heroic trip into the unknown. As Ryan Chilcott reports, an American millionaire has paid Russia a lot of money to be the first tourist in space. <laughs> U.S. millionaire Dennis Tito is now scheduled to lift off April 28th aboard a three-man Soyuz spacecraft for an eight-day round-trip journey to the International Space Station. He says his goal is to open up space travel to ordinary people. I would like to uh, uh, show that this can be done. Uh, it's not the most difficult uh, accomplishment in the world. And more and more people uh, should uh, follow. Tito reportedly paid Russia $20 million to fly to the space station Mir. But that plan went up in smoke when the Russians ditched their aging space station in the South Pacific last month. Instead, Russia has given Tito one of their spots on the International Space Station. For those who don't have $20 million, the Russian space shuttle flight simulator here in Gorky Park is the next best alternative. You can get a more down-to-earth seat on this relic of the Soviet space program for just $5. I'd love to look at the moon and earth from afar. I'm jealous that he gets to go. I can't stand heights, and so you won't get me up there. I'd like to see it on the ground, but from up there, no. But NASA says the International Space Station is not an amusement park, and an amateur like Tito would only get in the way. Tito's Russian flight commander praises him and warns NASA, if Tito doesn't fly, he says, the Soyuz spaceship doesn't fly. And if that Russian spaceship doesn't fly, the International Space Station could be left without a reliable escape vehicle, a scenario no one in this international partnership is willing to consider. A song dedicated to pilot Jeff Ashby awakened the crew aboard Endeavour for their fifth day on orbit. Good morning, Endeavour. Both sides now from Judy Collins for Jeff. A song for the moment from Paige. Good morning, Houston. Well, Paige, thanks for that uh, great wake up. We're sure looking forward to another fine day in space and uh, interesting this beautiful space station. On board the space station, the Expedition 2 crew of Yuri Yusachov, Susan Helms, and Jim Voss prepared to greet their first guests since taking residence on the station over a month ago. Before the shuttle crew entered the station, mission specialist Scott Perzinski powered up the shuttle's robot arm so its cameras could help view the testing on the new station arm that was attached during Sunday's spacewalk. The station and shuttle crews then opened the hatches between them and greeted each other face to face for the first time on orbit. After their greetings, the crews conducted a safety briefing and got to work. The new space station arm, commanded from the station's Destiny Lab, took its first step off its pallet and onto the side of the lab, becoming a part of the space station. The arm was put through a series of tests that showed it is in excellent health. Voss gave his assessment of the new robot arm. We've been very happy to operate the arm today and see that it works extremely well. Uh, it's been a great day for the space station getting our arm up here. This will allow us to continue building the space station. This was one of those linchpins that had to work, and it looks like it's going to work. There's more to do, more testing, and we still haven't got it completely uh, in operational state yet and off of the, the cradle, but I'm sure that everything's going to continue to work well, and we're looking forward to using it to keep building the station. Perazinski then used the shuttle arm to reach into Endeavour's payload bay and lift out the Raffaello multi-purpose logistics module, loaded with supplies to be unloaded into the ISS. Perazinski slowly raised the arm and docked it to a port on the Unity module of the station. Unloading a Raffaello will begin on Tuesday. Some of Endeavour's crew took a break from their work to answer a few questions about their flight. Ashby described opening the hatches and meeting the station crew. We brought them uh, several uh, items of food and some other things that they asked for to, uh, um, to make their uh, daily lives a little bit better up here. But as you can see behind us, it's a pretty nice place. Uh, we were really uh, pleasantly surprised when we came in and saw how clean and neat it was and how spacious. Canadian Space Agency astronaut Chris Hadfield talked about the operation of the new station arm called Canadarm2. Well, I'm, of course, extremely proud of the, uh, the product that we turned out back home. Uh, it is a complicated piece of hardware. The, the arm has 
mechanical complexity as well as a lot of software and computer complexity. And so even though we were confident, you, you still never know for sure. Um, and of course, Scott and I were the delivery men for that with, uh, with Jeff driving us around yesterday. So we had the, the mechanical end of it to hook up and a little bit of electrical yesterday. Uh, we are extremely happy with the results. The arm is working just as well as anybody could hope. And there were a lot of complicated things had to happen in a row. So we're very happy with the way it turned out and how it's working today. Parazinski gave a preview of Tuesday's spacewalk that he and Hadfield will conduct. We're really looking forward to the events of uh, tomorrow. Uh, we'll be going out for another six, six and a half hours, most likely. The main uh, emphasis will be to uh, reestablish the base of the uh, the new uh, Canada Arm 2 on the space station. We're going to be doing some rewiring work so that it can live and, and work here for the next uh, 15 or, or more years. We have to connect um, several uh, connectors on the side of the laboratory module, and uh, we also have to remove an early communications antenna off of the side of the node so that on the next assembly flight, Mission 7A, the airlock can be uh, attached there. Ashby later used Endeavour's thrusters to conduct a reboost of the space station. The reboosts are routinely done while a shuttle visits the station to maintain the proper orbit for the ISS. The crews then close the hatches between the ships to lower the air pressure on Endeavour to prepare the spacewalkers for tomorrow's excursion outside the station to continue hookups on Canadarm 2. This is Mission Control Houston. This is a playback of video recorded uh, earlier this morning on board Endeavour in the International yeah, Space Station. We've got a good downlink. This a tour recorded uh, by the crew earlier of the uh, entire complex, the uh, station. It's a pretty uh, crowded mid deck. And shuttle. Acker up here through the airlock station. John's uh, doing a wild change out on the uh, EMUs here. Starting to float up through the uh, PMA. It's a really different look and feel on the station. It's huge and uh, really beautiful, really well lit. There's the bell. on work on the, uh, the big arm for today. Chris is uh, trying to figure out all the, the camera set up here. Not easy. We're in the node. About to enter into the Russian segment through PMA-1. out the cone that uh, the crew's going to have to uh, relocate on an upcoming EVA. Here we are floating through a uh, really spacious FGB. It's amazing you can just fly like Superman the whole length of it. transfer uh, compartment of the service module and floating into the uh, URI's command post. Two URI's are talking shop here. Jeff took a 
flight back into uh, the Soyuz here. Here's the orbital module, and uh, down below is the uh, reentry portion of it. This now back with a live television view of the. And here we are back with our Houston, uh, really beautiful backdrop. Thanks, Scott and Jeff, for that tour. It's just incredible how big and beautiful the station is. We appreciate the look inside. Changed a lot since the last time we were here, Ellen. It sure has. Can't wait to go back. Im Andocken der US-Raumfähre Endeavour an der internationalen Raumstation ISS haben sich beide Besatzungen getroffen. Die ISS-Crew bereitete ihren Kollegen einen herzlichen Empfang. Zwei von ihnen hatten gestern an der Außenhülle der ISS einen 18 Meter großen Kranroboter angebracht. In einer Woche soll die Raumfähre Soyuz an der ISS andocken. Die Raumstation ISS hat nach sechs Monaten im All ihre ersten Besucher an Bord empfangen. Die Mannschaft der US-Raumfähre Endeavour. Und es gab Grund zum Feiern. Gemeinsam hatten die Astronauten erfolgreich einen riesigen Roboterarm an der ISS befestigt. Künftig soll er Reparaturarbeiten an der Raumstation übernehmen. The crew of the US Space Shuttle Endeavour met with fellow space travelers on board the International Space Station on Monday. There were handshakes and hugs all around after Endeavour crew members floated into the hatch. The rendezvous came after two shuttle astronauts installed a billion dollar robotic arm on the space station. The arm will serve as a high-tech construction crane throughout the station's lifetime. Meanwhile, the U.S. space agency NASA has dropped its objections to a space station visit by the world's first space tourist. California businessman Dennis Tito paid Russian authorities $20 million for the privilege. He met with officials in Moscow Monday in preparation for Saturday's scheduled blast-off with a pair of Russian cosmonauts. NASA had expressed concern that Tito's lack of formal training might endanger the mission. But after a telephone conversation between the heads of the Russian and U.S. space agencies Monday, Tito was cleared to visit the space station for one week. I will be doing... Uh my own experiments, uh, both uh, uh, stereo and uh, uh, video photography, as well as still photography, and uh, also hope to enjoy the beautiful view of the Earth. Tito was originally scheduled to visit Mir, but the destination was switched when the Russian space station was scrapped. How's that for an adventure holiday? Business news now. And in Docken der US-Raumfähre Endeavour an die internationale Raumstation ISS haben sich die Besatzungen ausgelassen begrüßt. Nach dem Öffnen der Ladeluken fielen sich die Astronauten in die Arme. Die Endeavour Crew hatte am Wochenende in mehrstündiger Arbeit einen riesigen Roboterarm an die Weltraumstation montiert. Jetzt soll mit Hilfe des Greifarms eine neue Andockstelle an der ISS installiert werden. ever by Louis Armstrong, chosen by Gail. Good morning, Houston and Steve. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I don't think you could say it or sing it any better than that. It really is a beautiful day and uh, really looking forward to seeing it from a really heavenly perspective outside of EVA today. And Scott, we want you to know that during EVA 1 you stopped MCC with your expressions, expressions of awe. And we really encourage you to keep up the color commentary. Have a great EVA. Well, thank you very much, Steve. We're both Chris and I are uh, thrilled to be going out today and uh, have some exciting work ahead of us. 
Okay, good morning, Alan. A beautiful day. Have you loud and clear also. Houston, EV2, contract. EV2, loud and clear as well. Good morning, Scott. Good morning, Alan. Have you loud and clear. Canadian Space Agency astronaut Chris Hadfield uh, in the foreground, Scott Perzinski in the background. Hadfield uh, will be designated extravehicular activity crew member one, uh, Perzinski EV2 during this spacewalk. Hadfield will wear a suit with red stripes around the legs uh, to distinguish him from uh, Perzinski in camera views. two astronauts are uh, wearing their liquid cooling vent garments, uh, those garments with uh, literally miles of very tiny tubes uh, sewn throughout them that through which uh, water circulates at uh, the uh, desired levels of the spacewalker to provide uh, cooling underneath their spacesuits. The uh, vent garments also have uh, padding on the shoulders, uh, places uh, where the uh, suit uh, can tend to rub uh, spacewalkers uh, during their work outside. This is Mission Control Houston. This is a live television view of astronaut uh, Scott Perezinski on the right and on the left, uh, Canadian Space Agency astronaut Chris Hadfield as they uh, near uh, completing donning their spacesuits. Perezinski adjusting his helmet lights and uh, cameras, uh, the lights uh, located uh, just below uh, the micro camera, which is uh, right on top in this uh, view. Those uh, helmet-mounted cameras provide a real-time view uh, during uh, the spacewalk. To uh, the shuttle crew, as uh, well as uh, the ground. This uh, view in uh, Endeavour's airlock is uh, the spacewalkers pre-breathe pure oxygen. They'll breathe pure oxygen for an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, this uh, Canadian Space Agency astronaut Chris Hadfield before they can begin depressurizing the airlock uh, en route to exiting the outer hatch and beginning their work outside. Again, that start is anticipated earlier than originally planned. Uh, the crew uh, breezing through their preparations uh, for the spacewalk today. Uh, the start's anticipated around 7.30 a.m. Central Time now. Rominger maneuvering in uh, the, essentially the tool belt uh, for the spacesuit. that including a uh, power tool that will be used uh, for power tool that's used uh, for uh, tightening and loosening uh, bolts uh, during the spacewalk. And uh, Perzinski now holding a uh, tether a, a rigid tether that acts as a type of third hand for the spacewalkers can be clamped on to handrails to help hold him steady uh, 
wherever he may be working on the outside of the station. This is a view of the uh, astronauts at work. As uh, on the uh, right, Perzinski uh, prepares to install a foot platform at the end of the shuttle's robotic arm. Station crew also opening uh, the lab window, opening the shutter on the window. Canadian Space Agency astronaut Chris Hadfield on the left uh, with uh, red stripes around the legs of his suit as he sets up tools and equipment for the spacewalk. Field is at work uh, further up on the station above Perzinski at the Unity module, uh, where it's performing tasks uh, related to removing a communications antenna uh, from a port on Unity, clearing the way for the detachment of an airlock on the next shuttle assembly flight to the station. This is uh, Chris Hadfield's helmet-mounted camera. Hadfield explaining a connector that uh, came apart as he took it off. Those are connectors associated with the communications antenna he's removed uh, from the port on Unity. He's at a port on the Unity connecting module on the station. This is a live television from Scott Perzinski's helmet-mounted camera. Perzinski uh, standing by as a uh, station crew checks the uh, power connections he's made for the primary power to the uh, fixture for the Canada Arm 2. I've uh, switched up uh, the P450 and 451 uh, duties, and uh, I put on uh, the Velcro strap on the lower portion, and I'll get the upper portion next. This is Mission Control Houston. Uh, Chris Hadfield uh, is retrieving uh, several T-handle tools, the tools used to uh, turn the uh, mechanisms that hold the panels on the exterior of the Destiny Lab that uh, in anticipation that uh, another panel on the lab may have to be removed uh, to double check further connections uh, that could be the source of difficulties uh, with the, the backup power connection for the grapple fixture that uh, was made by uh, Perzinski earlier in the spacewalk. but failed to show a power feed, a backup power feed being made to that fixture for the arm. This is a view of the uh, Canada Arm 2. As seen from the helmet camera of uh, Scott Perzinski, that arm powered uh, through his connections, uh, the, uh, through the primary power connection, uh, the station now turning again to another check on the backup power connection. Yeah, this is the way to translate on the lab. Isn't that great? And if you flip 180, you can see where you're going as you translate along. It's yeah. Really neat. Way back out of your way. Yeah. Of course, you have the booms kind of close, so. Yep. Wow. So which ones have you done so far? I've done all of them, actually. Uh, 
Houston for ABS. Go ahead, Alan. 30.5. In uh, this view from uh, Scott Perzinski's helmet-mounted camera, uh, Chris Hadfield can be seen doing uh, his task at present, which is uh, checking the quiver cover uh, where they stole, uh, stowed uh, super bolts, these uh, yard-long bolts that were removed on the first spacewalk to uh, loosen the launch restraints on the uh, Canon Arm 2. In front of uh, Perzinski, the uh, connecting panel, cable connector panel that he has been at uh, work at, This now, the uh, connector designed to supply backup power at the base of the uh, fixture to which the arm is attached. The crew inspecting the pins in that connector and uh, in its uh, socket uh, to ascertain if there's any uh, identifiable problem. It's Mission Control Houston, that uh, call greeted with applause in the station flight control room here in Houston. Uh, Breathing a sigh of relief as uh, that uh, apparently the inspection uh, and the disconnection and reconnection of that uh, connector downstream at the base of the arm fixture did the trick. Uh, as uh, Susan Helms just reported, she sent a command that showed that the backup power supply is now being fed to the arm fixture. Uh, that to having both the primary and backup power now supplied to that fixture, uh, just as planned, uh, solving the problem. Celebrating down here. That's great. That's just outstanding news. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm holding on to one fabric handrail with the world up to my right. It's just unbelievable. Traveling 18,000 miles an hour. Yeah, it's not bad. Shoot. With my face into the wind. <laughs> unbelievable. Those cables had to be connected properly so that uh, the arm could take its power and data from that location. Uh, the initial work to uh, make that uh, connection uh, succeeded in getting the primary cables connected, but the secondary cables proved to be a problem. Uh, the crew uh, opened an additional panel and was able to get access to a connector, removed that connector, reconnected it, and then was able to restore power to the secondary uh, circuit. Definitely not a clearance issue. Berzinski mounted on a portable foot restraint on the end of the shuttle robotic arm, holding the uh, direct current switching unit in his hands. Uh, in that box, he's going to attach it to a, an attachment point on the side of the Destiny Laboratory module. All of the objectives for today's spacewalk so far uh, accomplished, although there were a couple of problems that have lengthened the spacewalk. Uh, one was the uh, inability of the spacewalkers to initially get the secondary pow power to the Canada Arm 2 uh, attached. They had to open an additional panel and uh, disconnect and reconnect one of the connectors under that panel uh, and able to restore the electricity, uh, the power and data uh, through that system and it worked well. In addition, uh, early on the spacewalk, uh, they removed an early communications antenna from the common berthing mechanism on the Unity module uh, to free it up for the arrival of the new 
airlock on the next space shuttle mission. Uh, in the process of doing that, uh, a connector piece uh, came off of one of the cables and floated inside the common berthing mechanism. Uh, the crew went back and tried to look around and see if they could find a piece of that. Uh, and with careful coordination with the International Space Station flight control room, open and closed the four pow the four pedals on that common berthing mechanism. The uh, pedals are protective coverage uh, for, for the mechanism's latches. And uh, was unable to find the uh, piece of connector that uh, they had lost. Uh, no word yet on exactly where that connector might be. It could still be inside or it could have drifted out of the area uh, during the uh, portion of the spacewalk when the spacewalkers were away from there. All the sockets look uh, really clean. And we got a good view of that. Scott, looks good to us. Once crew goes to sleep, the uh, Payload Operations Center at Marshall Space Flight Center in Houston is going to be conducting uh, ground commanded testing and checkouts of that for uh, preparation for the payload transfers on the following day. Kane is traveling from this British base towards the South Pole to rescue a doctor who is actually ill at the Amazon Scott base. This is the British base and this is the plane. It's a very tiny plane known as a twin otter and the reason they're using this very tiny plane, you can actually see it better here, is it can withstand temperatures of minus 75 degrees Celsius before its hydraulic fluid begins to freeze. We keep you up to date with that situation and when it does reach the South Pole it rests for 10 hours and then hopefully it will get a weather window to come off and bring the doctor back in Safety. Dennis Taito kann als erster Weltraumtourist ins All starten. Die NASA gab nach langem Zögern ihren Widerstand auf. In Begleitung der russischen Kosmonauten besichtigte Taito auf dem Weltraumbahnhof bei Konur zum ersten Mal die Raumkapsel Soyuz, mit der er am Samstag ins All starten will. 40 Millionen Mark kostet Taito das Vergnügen, mögliche Schäden, die er anrichtet, muss... Kanische Multimillionär Dennis Taito darf als erster Weltraumtourist ins All reisen. Die US-Weltraumbehörde NASA hat nach langem Zögern dem Vorhaben zugestimmt. Der 60-Jährige bekam heute eine Ausnahmegenehmigung für seinen Flug zur internationalen Raumstation ISS. Er will am 28. April an Bord eines russischen Raumschiffes zur Station starten. Taito hat der russischen Raumfahrtbehörde für die Reise rund 44 Millionen Mark gezahlt. Die Astronauten zudem ein Notstromaggregat anbringen und eine Antenne entfernen. Unter Zeitdruck litten sie dabei nicht. Für den Fall von Verzögerungen hatte die NASA von vornherein einen dritten Ausstieg einkalkuliert. Genug Gelegenheit also, das Great Barrier Reef vor der australischen Küste zu bewundern. Seine Schönheit sei überwältigend, sagte Hatfield, der als erster Kanadier ins All ausgestiegen war. Dennis Tito darf nun doch auf Weltraumreise gehen. Nach langem Zögern gab die US-Behörde NASA grünes Licht. Tito fliegt am Samstag mit einer russischen Soyuz-Kapsel zur internationalen Raumstation ISS. Der Hobbyastronaut hatte den Russen 20 Millionen Dollar gezahlt. Aus Sicherheitsgründen hatte die NASA sein Vorhaben zunächst gestoppt. Der 60-Jährige wird fünf Tage im All die Arbeit von zwei russischen Kosmonauten begleiten. 
haben Astronauten der Internationalen Raumstation ISS ihren Weltraumspaziergang erfolgreich beendet. Zum zweiten Mal innerhalb einer Woche hatten die Männer die Station verlassen. Mit Hilfe eines Roboterarms verlegten sie Stromkabel an der Außenwand der ISS. Der Spaziergang der beiden Astronauten der US-Raumfähre Endeavour dauerte siebeneinhalb Stunden. And they plan to lift off for a British research station on Wednesday morning and then push on to Chile. But as Gary Tuckman reports, rescuers are still hopeful of a takeoff soon. The eight-seat twin-engine plane equipped with skis is on the South Pole runway. Engines warming up as we speak, ready to go. It should be leaving at any time. But those engines have been warming up for two hours, waiting for a perfect break in the weather. And because of that, they are now refueling the plane that you see on the screen right there. That was the plane when it was here in Chile before it left a few days ago to go to the South Pole, but it's on the South Pole getting ready to leave. Aboard that plane, Dr. Ronald Chemensky, a physician at the U.S. Abinson Scott South Pole Station who has been diagnosed with a potentially life-threatening condition. The decision was made that he must be evacuated from the pole and brought here to Chile as soon as possible before the treacherous weather gets worse than it is now, and it's very bad now. The small plane arrived at the South Pole 16 hours ago. It's scheduled to arrive 10 hours after it leaves at Britain's Rothera Station. That's at the tip of Antarctica. That's not as treacherous the weather there as what you see here at the U.S. station right in the middle of Antarctica. And you can log on to our website while you wait for more reports on that rescue mission. We'll link you to other relevant sites with some great photos. And we'll tell you which nations routinely carry out experiments at bases across the continent. The address, cnn.com. Time now for a look at global weather. Here's Femi OK. Femi? Thank you very much, Jonathan. I have to say that John, uh, uh, we're just taking that report, the very last report, down from Punta Serenas, which is down here. It's known as the Roaring Forties because it's so cold. I have to say also in the meteorological calendar that today is the birthday of Anders Celsius. In fact, he was the gentleman who invented the Celsius scale, which basically goes from zero at the melting point of ice right the way up to 100, which is the boiling point of water. Let me give you a quick trip into conversions because you can actually use this in this next forecast how do you convert celsius into fahrenheit mostly the u.s uses fahrenheit the rest of the world and the scientific community actually use celsius so you take your celsius temperature you double it and then you add 30 so take seven celsius double it makes uh, 14 then add 30 that makes 44 and you're just a tiny little bit out and the actual real celsius temperature is 45 degrees in fahrenheit so you can use that as we work through our weather starting down in Punta Serenas, and that's where you actually see the wind and the wet weather stretching across. And passenger aboard a private plane are unusually happy to be back on the ground. The plane made an emergency landing at a Miami area airport after radioing that it was having landing gear trouble. The pilot made, I think you can see it there, a one-wheel landing at Opelaka Airport. One of the engines was shut down and the plane skidded safely to a stop. Afterward, the pilot and his single passenger, their names have not been released, hugged at the side of the runway. A computer glitch on board the International Space Station has delayed a test of its new robotic arm. Astronauts from the U.S. Space Shuttle Endeavour have been installing the billion-dollar big arm. It will be used to construct further additions to the space station. The device was to undergo its first major test on Tuesday. Meanwhile, a U.S. millionaire's bid to become the world's first space tourist seems to be going along without a hitch. Matthew Chance has that report. He paid the Russians $20 million to fly into space, angering NASA, but providing much-needed cash for Moscow's struggling space program. Russia said he would fly no matter what. Final agreement was reached only after NASA received written guarantees that the world's first space tourist wouldn't sue in the event of injury and would pay for any sensitive equipment on board the International Space Station that he breaks. Well, if, if I break it, uh, I have to buy it. So um, if I break the whole station, I guess I'm going to have to buy the whole station. For months, this Californian millionaire has been at the center of a battle for control over resources on the International Space Station. He was originally intended to visit Mir, but the aging craft was abandoned and fell to Earth last month. Russian officials have been insisting Denis Tito's efforts would not go to waste. 
Tito isn't just a tourist, he's a member of the crew, has been in serious training for nine months, has been through 900 hours of theoretical and practical training. You could say he's a semi-cosmonaut who deserves serious attention. But NASA says a number of experiments will be shut down during Mr. Tito's six-day visit. The risk of working with an amateur, they say, is simply too great. And although Russia says there may be more trips for space tourists in the future, NASA and other partners on the International Space Station say Denis Tito's pioneering visit should be an exceptional case. <laughs> Matthew Chance, CNN Moscow. Now a transportation story that's a little more down to earth. A British inventor has come up with a bicycle that can be folded up and carried in a case. The Scoot, it's called, is designed to complement public transportation. And the concept is not entirely new, but the company says this bike is different because it's easier to carry than other fold-up bikes and a lot less likely to attract attention. Environmentalists like the idea. We think the idea of fold-up bicycles is extremely sensible. It marries the bicycle, which is the cheapest, most efficient, most flexible form of personal transport, with the public transport system, which enables you to go much, much further. The bike and train is an ideal combination. Something about the scoot that's not so small is the price, more than a thousand US dollars. Thanks for joining us this hour. I'm Juanita Phillips in London. And I'm Jonathan Mann at CNN Center. More world news, scooting right up. Die motorigen Propellermaschine in der Nähe von Miami ist für den Piloten und einen weiteren Passagier glimpflich ausgegangen. Das Flugzeug befand sich im Landeanflug, als sich zwei der drei Fahrwerke nicht ausfahren ließen. Um die Maschine zu stabilisieren, schaltete der Pilot den rechten Propeller ab. Nach dem Aufsetzen rutschte das Kleinflugzeug über die Landebahn und blieb auf der Seite liegen. Die Insassen kamen mit dem Schrecken davon. Treatment after a daring rescue from the South Pole. The small plane carrying Dr. Ronald Shemensky is expected to land in about six hours at a British research station on the Antarctic Peninsula. A second plane is then expected to carry the doctor to Chile, one of the last legs of the trip. Dr. Shemensky suffers from a potentially life-threatening pancreatic condition. He's to be treated for it in the United States. Well, Dr. Shemensky leaves behind him bitter cold days of near constant darkness and isolation. Those who work in Antarctica have to contend with one of the harshest environments known to man. But as Natalie Pavelski reports, there are job opportunities at the bottom of the world if you can handle the conditions. People who agree to work the winter in Antarctica know they can't leave for about eight months because severe cold, ferocious weather, and endless darkness make landing planes too dangerous. So before they go, they get a complete physical, based in part on NASA's medical guidelines for astronauts. But the process is not foolproof. For example, in 1999, Dr. Jerry Nielsen had a clear mammogram just before she left for the South Pole. Then she found a lump in her breast and became one of three doctors in a row who've run into medical problems during the Antarctic winter. The odds of this happening are, are just too high to calculate, and I, I really can't explain it, but it's, it's strange. It makes you think of a jinx. Prospective South Pole dwellers go through psychological screening as well, an effort to make sure they'll be able to handle the relative isolation of working at the bottom of the world. But while Antarctica is a workplace like no other, a lot of the jobs there are the kind you see listed in any newspaper. Openings for carpenters, plumbers, and office workers are among the current job listings. 
Most scientists make research trips during the Austral summer, when the population at the three American stations in Antarctica swells to about 3,500, ten times the winter population. Medical emergencies happen then, too, but planes can more easily evacuate patients, so they don't tend to make headlines. Medical efforts don't always succeed. Last year, for example, two people died at American stations in Antarctica, one from a blood clot, the other from unspecified natural causes. Like everywhere else on Earth, in Antarctica, death is a part of life. Natalie Pavelski, CNN. And you can log on to our website for more on the South Pole Rescue Mission. We'll link you to other relevant sites with some great photos. And we'll tell you which countries use the South Pole to carry out scientific experiments. The address cnn.com. Die beiden Astronauten waren aus der US-Raumfähre Endeavour ausgestiegen, um einen siebenteiligen Roboter an der internationalen Raumstation ISS anzubringen. Der Arbeitstag im All dauerte länger als geplant, weil zunächst Probleme mit der Energiezufuhr gelöst werden mussten. Mit der Hilfe des Roboters sollen künftig Reparaturen an der Außenseite der ISS ausgeführt werden. Dadurch wird die Zahl der risikoreichen Ausstiege der Astronauten ins All verringert. It's an American doctor suffering from a life-threatening illness. Dr. Ronald Chemensky, based at the Amundsen Scott Pole Station, had been diagnosed with a serious gallbladder condition. His rescue mission has taken many days and covered thousands of miles in often terrible conditions. Well, we can speak now to Peter West from the U.S. National Science Foundation, which oversaw the rescue. Peter West, just tell us how the rescue was actually completed. Um, well, the, the plane uh, flew in last night to Amazon Scott South Pole Station and arrived at about 8.02 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time in the United States. Uh, the crew spent the, the night on the ground. Uh, they brought in a replacement physician. That would be Dr. Betty Carlisle. Uh, she has a lot of experience in the Antarctic and recently was the, uh, the summer doctor uh, at McMurdo Station, the main U.S. station in Antarctica. The plane <coughs> left the South Pole at uh, 12.47 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time again today and is en route to Rothra, which is a British Antarctic survey station on the Antarctic Peninsula and is expected to arrive about 10.10 this evening. And how is Dr. Shemensky? Uh, my understanding, I have not had any direct communication with him, but my understanding is, as has been the case uh, largely since this, this began, he uh, is recovering from his gallbladder condition and is in uh, good health and is up and around and, and able to, to fend for himself. Uh, the issue prompting the evacuation and the issue that we uh, uh, weighed when we decided to do the evacuation was that there is a statistical possibility of a relapse in his condition, uh, in which case it could be quite serious. And so looking to the health and safety both of Dr. Shemensky and of the other 49 people on the station, we decided to bring him back so that he could receive the appropriate medical care in the United States and to replace him with uh, Dr. Carlisle. But as of today, there must be an immense sense of achievement for all of you to mount such a difficult rescue in the middle of the Antarctic winter. Uh, well, it, it is a tribute to the, the skill of, of the pilots uh, and the air crew for Ken Boric Air, uh, as well as to all the people who are doing the logistics on the ground to make sure the pilots get there, and the folks at the station who made sure that it was... Uh, it was uh, prepared for them to arrive, so all of those people deserve uh, a hearty round of thanks. And we will be very, very happy once Dr. Shemensky is back in Punta Arenas, which is where he will uh, finally arrive before he continues on to the United States. We're going to stop you there. Peter West, congratulations. Thank you very much. Thanks. Eigentlich ist der Arzt für die Gesundheit der 50 Wissenschaftler zuständig, die am Südpol in der Station Amundsen-Scott arbeiten. Doch nun ist er selber lebensbedrohlich erkrankt und dringend auf Hilfe von außen angewiesen. Bislang scheiterten die Rettungsversuche an den extremen Wetterbedingungen. Im Wettlauf mit der Zeit hat sich jetzt ein Helferteam aufgemacht, um das Leben des Mediziners zu retten. Inzwischen ist das Team sicher gelandet, doch das Risiko steigt, dass nun auch die Helfer im Eis gefangen bleiben. Nicole Mascherodeno über den Überlebenskampf am Südpol. Es ist im wahrsten Sinne des Wortes das Ende der Welt. 50 Forscher leben in den kälteisolierten Containern der amerikanischen Edmondson-Scott-Forschungsstation. Sie haben einen Arzt und der ist schwer krank. 
Ronald Schemensky quält ein Gallenleiden und eine lebensgefährliche Bauchspeicheldrüsenerkrankung. Zwar hat eine Antibiotikabehandlung, die er sich selbst in der Krankenstation verabreicht hat, angeschlagen, doch man befürchtet einen Rückfall. Und das wäre dramatisch für Schemensky, aber auch die anderen Forscher, die somit ohne medizinische Versorgung dem langen Polarwinter ausgeliefert werden. Bei Temperaturen bis zu minus 90 Grad ist es eigentlich zwischen Februar und November unmöglich, hierher zu fliegen. Zwei wagemutige Teams haben nun die gefährliche Rettungsaktion doch gewagt. Mit an Bord der zweimotorigen Twin-Otter-Maschinen, die Ärztin Discheminski ersetzen soll. Ich habe schon einmal zwei Jahre am Südpol verbracht, so Dr. Kaleisley. Ich liebe den Pol, es ist ein einzigartiger Ort, besonders die Polarnacht. Wenn auch die Umstände traurig sind, ich freue mich dennoch. Zwei Propellermaschinen, eine zum Einsatz, die andere als Sicherheit, starteten am Sonntag vom Flughafen in Puerto Arenas in Chile. Ihr erstes Ziel, die britische Station Rotera im Norden der antarktischen Halbinsel. Dann das wirkliche Wagnis. Zu dieser Jahreszeit nie zuvor gelungen, der 10-Stunden-Flug bis Edmondson Scott. In totaler Dunkelheit bei Wind und Temperaturen bis zu minus 60 Grad. Das Team kam am Dienstag tatsächlich unversehrt an. Nur leider hindern jetzt schlechte Wetterbedingungen den Piloten daran, mit dem erkrankten Arzt zurückzufliegen. Es scheint fast, als hinge ein Fluch über der Edmondson Scott Forschungsstation, denn die Vorgängerin des erkrankten Arztes war Dr. Jerry Nielsen, die Frau, die in der Abgeschiedenheit der Polarnacht an sich selbst Brustkrebs diagnostizierte und behandelte. Sie wurde im Oktober 1999 in einer ähnlichen Kamikaze-Aktion ausgeflogen. Roland Schiminski hat dies noch nicht geschafft. Es sieht ganz so aus, als wolle der Südpol die Menschen herausfordern, die ihm zu nahe rücken. aboard Space Shuttle Endeavour and the International Space Station were awakened by Mission Control to an Italian song selected by the wife of European Space Agency astronaut Umberto Guidoni. Guidoni answered the wake-up call. It's been a really uh, a good experience. Uh, a trip uh, in space is uh, really the, the final uh, voyage uh, and um, I have seen uh, from space uh, The crews got up and went to work unloading the Italian-built Raffaello logistics module, a sophisticated moving van for delivering experiments and other supplies to the ISS. A computer glitch that occurred overnight forced a delay in the day's testing on the newly installed space station robotic arm called Canadarm2. Those tests including a handoff of the pallet attached to Canadarm2 back to the shuttle arm, have been deferred until Thursday at the earliest. Some communications and commanding between mission control and the station were also affected by the computer glitch, causing some planned activities, including a second reboost of the ISS, to be delayed. Space Station flight engineer Jim Voss expressed confidence in his team on the ground. Okay, we'll work on other things while y'all are solving this problem. We know you can do it, because y'all are good and we'll be standing by ready to work when you're ready for us. That sounds like a good plan, and we appreciate your confidence. Believe me, I have tremendous confidence in the team down there. If I didn't have it, I wouldn't be up here. Guidoni and Shuttle Commander Kent Rominger took a break from unloading activities to speak with dignitaries from the European and Italian space agencies. Guidoni spoke about the role Europe is playing in this flight. We are talking to you from, from the MPLM module, or from Raffaello, which has been docked to the station yesterday. And as you can see, it's a module that is really nice and big to carry goods and everything we need aboard the space station. For me, it is a great honor to be here representing not just Italy, but all of the uh, old continent. Rominger gave an overview of the materials being transferred to the station. There are four experiments that we are transferring. Some of them are protein crystals, some of them are biology experiments. So the science, the majority of the science is yet to come on station. We're bringing up uh, five different experiments for them that will just start going. So the actual science uh, will be cranking up mostly after we leave, but everything else on board the station is going great. 
Raffaello continued to be unloaded and powered experiments were delivered to the station's destiny laboratory and installed along the lab's walls. The experiments will allow science work to begin in earnest on board the station. As the unloading and reloading of Raffaello continued on board the station through the rest of the day, Mission Control worked to troubleshoot the station's computer issues in hopes of continuing checkouts on the new station arm on Thursday. diagnostic, but they're not up in standby. And Bob, we are connected to the MDM, and it looks like the data is good. It shows CNC-1 in standby and CNC-3 in backup. Okay, well, the fact that you're connected is extraordinarily good news. Uh, since we didn't have I.O. with CNC-1 and 3, I don't know if we can believe their status, but we can believe that CNC-2 is up and running, which is extraordinarily good news. Alpha Houston, we've got data. Alpha Houston, we've got data. That's great news. This is Mission Control. Houston, that uh, last uh, step, as uh, Susan Helms on board the station continues working at her laptop, uh, going through a series of steps sent up uh, to her to uh, reconfigure the computer system on board and the communications for the station. Uh, the uh, station flight control room now has uh, telemetry data, uh, insight into the station systems. Uh, for all ISS PCSs, what is the intent of the next couple of steps? It doesn't match exactly our nav path. That uh, very good news uh, for controllers as they uh, plan to now execute a series of steps to uh, safe uh, the system. Uh, the computer systems and uh, commanding on board. This is Mission Control Houston. This is now a live television view of the Raffaello Logistics Module. A crew uh, busily unloading and reloading that module, uh, basically uh, mostly reloading at this point, uh, preparing the module for a trip back to Earth in Endeavour's cargo bay. A proposal for the uh, schedule for today for the crew would have them focus uh, solely on uh, Raffaello, uh, reloading that uh, module with unneeded equipment and trash from the station to be brought back to Earth, uh, that uh, culminating then later today in the detachment of the Raffaello module from the station uh, to be put back into Endeavour's payload bay for the trip back home. Robotics activities, uh, a handoff of the Space Lab pallet from the station arm to the shuttle arm, 
and a dress rehearsal with the station arm of activities uh, that will be performed for the next shuttle assembly mission in June. All those robotics activities would be deferred until tomorrow on Friday to take place. The crew's uh, well ahead in their activities uh, with Raffaello, uh, thanks to their work yesterday in unloading almost 4,000 pounds of equipment and supplies uh, from that uh, logistics carrier and uh, today's activities of reloading uh, the module with unneeded equipment and trash from the station. Over the next couple of hours, the crew will finish up loading this module. Uh, the master of activities uh, in that uh, loading and unloading of equipment uh, on the left-hand side of the screen is Umberto Guidoni, a European Space Agency astronaut, the first European Space Agency astronaut, uh, one of the partners in the station, to visit the orbiting complex. He's conferring with Endeavour's commander, Kent Romanger. Alpha Houston, no response required. We have KU now, and we are inside the MPLM. Romanger and uh, Guidoni looking at the camera on the right, uh, stowing items away. Uh, astronauts uh, Scott Perezinski and uh, pilot uh, for Endeavour, Jeff Ashby. On board the International Space Station, Flight Engineer Jim Voss uh, made a report to the folks in the International Station Flight Control Room that half the lights inside the Destiny Laboratory module had gone out. The folks on the ground are taking a look, trying to determine exactly what happened there. It may be related to these computer problems that uh, are continuing to be worked uh, on the ground. The crew was told there's uh, no immediate actions they need to be taking, and uh, all systems are in a safe configuration on board the International Space Station. Also, spacecraft communicator Katie Coleman here in the shuttle control room uh, having discussions with John Phillips on board the shuttle about the uh, camera plans that would be uh, put into effect uh, should we decide to go ahead with the plan to grapple and unberth the Raffaello multipurpose logistics module from the Unity module and put it back into the shuttle's payload bay for return to home. As yet, a decision has not been made on whether that activity will be attempted uh, on this day for the crew. Meanwhile, uh, the crew continues to go through its work in making sure that all of the items that uh, need to be returned to that cargo carrier are back inside and ready to be coming home. Again, uh, good news greeted the space station flight controllers this morning when after they awakened, uh, Expedition 2 flight engineer Susan Helms was able to get International Space Station computer systems on the road to uh, normal recovery. She was working on a laptop computer board the station. Go ahead, Alpha. Hey, Joe, Yuri and I just checked them and they appear to be tracking now over to where the service module arrays are. And we copy Susan. Helms worked at a laptop computer station on the on, on board the International Space Station uh, that serves as one of the primary interfaces with the command and control computer system. And about 3.45 a.m. today, she reported that uh, a series of troubleshooting steps had restored the ground's ability to monitor and send commands to the station's systems. Station flight controllers then sent commands that uh, have been able to put the station's systems into a better configuration. Uh, in an event that we have further computer problems today. They also sent commands that transmitted data to the ground from the station computers that are allowing technicians to thoroughly analyze the software situation on board. In addition, uh, continuing troubleshooting has gone on. Uh, the uh, ground team has been able to power off and power on the computers aboard the Unity module making sure that both of those are working well and uh, have confirmed that that uh, is the case, uh, that a uh, very important key to the ability to control the common berthing mechanism to which Raffaello is docked and uh, therefore release it so that it could be unberthed and returned to the payload bay of the shuttle. But the uh, flight controllers and engineers working on the computer problems on the stations hoping to get an additional uh, 
command and control computer back up as a redundant set so that uh, before they go ahead with that unberthing, they'd like to have as much redundancy as possible. Alpha Houston for Susan. Yes, Susan, you should be able to use that UOP now. You will have power to it, and we are also working on getting your lights back up, and you should then in the lab, and you should have them up momentarily. Okay, I thank you, and Mr. FPP, thank you. Thanks, and Susan. And it is powered back on. Thanks, Susan. And with that discussion between Charlie Kamada on the ground and Susan Helms on orbit, uh, a confirmation that the uh, effort that the uh, power heating and lighting officer in the International Space Station Light Control Room ha was a success, and that uh, power is back to that utility out panel, and uh, the crew being told that the folks on the ground will be turning on their lights uh, in just the next few minutes. This is Mission Control Houston as the Space Shuttle and Space Station, over 245 statute miles above the southern portion of Africa. Spacecraft communicator Charlie Kamada letting the crew on board the space station know that it appears that the multiplexer, demultiplexer computer units in the Unity module of the space station appear to have uh, gone down again. Uh, flight controllers in the International Space Station flight control are continuing to uh, look at their data on that right now. Also asking uh, Jim Voss on board the station to uh, power down all but uh, two of the portable computer systems in the Destiny Laboratory module and to minimize their use as this continuing troubleshooting with the computers goes on at the ground level. Endeavor and Alpha on the big loop. I understand you're in the service module and may not be able to talk uh, back to us, so I'll just give you this update. We are standing down on MPLM uh, ops for a deinstall tonight. And uh, we're going to look into look into our situation a little further, assess some of our failures, and get in a real good config before we decide to do that. Uh, I know that you're down there in the SM, and if you want to just give us a call when you're done with your meal, I'll tell you what else is on the plate tonight. Um, we're still looking into how far into uh, de-outfitting and closing the hatch and getting the MPLM all ready, how far into that we'd like to go tonight. Hey, Katie, thanks for that big picture. Uh, we copy... Uh, we're just floating over to the uh, service module now from Endeavor, so if uh, you need us to be a big loop, this is a good loop to call us on, and we will give you a ring. If it's anything uh, you really need us to get on, let us know. Otherwise, it will probably still be a good 45 minutes before we finish up our meal. Copy. Rommel, the MMT has met, and we have extended the mission at least one more day. We do not at this time have a... Um, have a, a time for you that we're going to perform the MPLM and SLP uh, handoff activities. But as soon as we know that, we'll let you know, hopefully when you get up in the morning. But if not, we think that there are lots of uh, things that you as uh, two crews together can be doing to get the uh, ISS in good shape. Hey, Katie, we agree. Uh, we've been tagging up, and they've got a lot of tasks uh, lined up that we can help them with. They've got plenty of work to keep us employed up here. We copy. We think, uh, you know, ISS is in a good config. Uh, Dock the shuttle there. It's a great time to be able to understand these kinds of problems. And in the meantime, uh, we get to put the ISS crew in a much better shape before you leave. Arbeit an Bord der Internationalen Raumstation ISS. Durch den Ausfall des Zentralrechners mussten die Tests mit dem neuen Roboterarm verschoben werden. Auch der Funkverkehr mit der Bodenstation war zeitweise unterbrochen. Die NASA hofft, den Fehler in ein bis zwei Tagen zu beheben. Für die Besatzung bestehe keine Gefahr. By air from the South Pole for medical treatment is expected to arrive in Chile shortly. Schmensky was the only doctor at the Amundsen Scott South Pole Station. He's been diagnosed with pancreatitis. Propellers. It only has eight seats inside, and that is the plane that flew into the harshest weather 
on Earth right now on the South Pole. Right now, you see it has its landing tires on the bottom, but when it went to the South Pole, it had skis, literally snow skis, because it didn't land on a runway. It landed on an ice rink, basically. What they had to do at the South Pole, the 50 U.S. scientists who are there, was shovel snow to create a smooth ice pond for this plane to land on, and that's precisely what it did. It flew in a blinding snowstorm with heavy winds, but made it there safely, dropped off another doctor, by the name of Betty Carlisle, because Dr. Shemansky was the only doctor there. Betty Carlisle has now taken his place, picked up Dr. Shemansky, waited a couple of hours, spent the night there, everyone relaxing, waiting for the weather to clear, and then yesterday, leaving there, 12.45 Eastern time, to fly to the British base, the Rothera Station, which is the closest base in the South Pole to South America, and then continuing here. With me right now is Steve Dunbar. Steve is with Raytheon Polar Services, the company that employs Dr. Shemansky. He was in charge of this operation, getting the doctor back here. Let me ask you at this point, Steve, how relieved are you that the plane has made it safely? Oh, we're all just very excited and pleased that they made it back and that all the, the planning and hard work that everybody put in came through and we made it happen. How concerned were you about this mission? Well, I think we, had, we knew that there was a chance that the... Uh, that we might not be able to get in and swap the doctors out. Uh, the level of concern actually wasn't that high in terms of uh, the safety of the crew. We knew we were going to be able to get the airplane, make the attempt, and come back. We felt pretty good about that. Knowing that this was the first rescue mission in the polar winter to the South Pole, how, what made you so sure that it would be so successful? Well, we hired the best crews. We came up with a, a, lot, of, uh, a lot of contingency planning on what we were going to do in terms of navigation, in terms of the operation of the aircraft. We double-checked on what the airplane was capable of. Uh, checked with the engine manufacturer what the airplane could do, and uh, we, were, we were fairly confident that we could pull it off. Now, Dr. Shemansky works with you. What are you going to say to him in a few minutes when you go to see him? <laughs> I think, uh, actually, I need to go out to the aircraft right now. You're going out right now. Okay. You're going to see in a couple of minutes a man in a yellow and black jacket, and that's the gentleman we were just talking with, Steve Dunbar, the manager of field operations for Raytheon Polar Services, who is going to go talk to Dr. Shemansky when he comes off the plane just now. But Dr. Shemansky's family had said he wanted to complete his year. He was supposed to be in the South Pole for a year. It is an area of beauty, of solitude, harsh, harsh weather. The only worst weather on Earth right now would not be on Earth. It would be on the planet Mars and planets far away from the sun. There's nothing like it on Earth. These people live in temperatures that average this time of year 75 below zero Fahrenheit, 60 below zero Celsius, and with the wind chill, sometimes it gets to 143 below zero Fahrenheit which is about 90 below zero Celsius. So it's very harsh weather. Shemansky wanted to stay there. He's 59 years old. He's from Oak Harbor, Ohio. That's his hometown, but he now lives in Colorado where Raytheon Polar Services is based. Now, as we're speaking to you, a contingent from Raytheon Polar Services is now walking out to that plane, including the gentleman we were just, just talked to, Steve Dunbar, to greet the doctor. Dr. Shemensky will be staying here in Chile until at least tomorrow, most likely Saturday. The plan for him is to take it easy, relax a little bit, and then he will go to Colorado where he lives and works to go into the hospital this weekend so he can have procedures taken care of to repair the problems that forced him to leave Antarctica in the first place. And now take a look at the reunion that's about to occur. A touching scene, heroism among the crew members, the pilot of this plane, Sean Lovett, actually he pronounced his name Ludit, we want to pronounce his name right, he's doing such a great job. A private charter company from Canada owns this airplane. Sean Ludit, Mark Carey were flying it. This is the company that specializes in Arctic and Antarctic flight. The thought was, you may be wondering, why use such a small plane for such a treacherous flight? You don't want to use a plane with lots of moving pieces, we're told, and whether that's this cold. With lots of landing gear, with lots of wing flaps, with potential problems with big planes in the cold weather, it's easier to use a simple and more nimble plane like the Twin Otter. And that's what this company, based out of Canada, uses. The decision was made to use this plane to get Dr. Shemensky to safety. But it's interesting when you hear Steve Dunbar talk about how confident he was. The fact is, in all the years that man has inhabited Antarctica and visited the science stations there, and it's been about half a century, 
there has never been a plane landing there during the polar winter. So there was a certain amount of risk. Although these gentlemen have told us over the past couple of days that we've been in Chile, that there's a lot of redundancy. That they had two planes. You saw the blue plane behind the red plane. That blue plane that came in was another twin otter that was also at the British base at the Rothera station. And you were just watching a live coverage of CNN's Gary Tuckman reporting on the landing of Dr. Ronald Shemansky from Antarctica in uh, Punta Arenas, Chile. Shemansky had been uh, diagnosed with pancreatitis. He is doing better, but it was decided to evacuate him from the research facility at the South Pole in case uh, that the illness got worse. The flight to uh, Chile began early Thursday, but was made under difficult and risky conditions. Takeoffs and landings were made on snow and ice. Ronald Shemansky was evacuated from Antarctica on Wednesday after the rescue plane managed a tricky takeoff and landing on ice and snow. His plane arrived less than an hour ago in Punta Arenas, Chile. Dr. Shemensky was the only physician at the U.S. National Science Foundation facility on the South Pole. Although his condition, pancreatitis, has improved, a decision was made to bring him to the United States for treatment to avoid further and possibly fatal attacks. Danke schön noch an die Kollegen für den netten Gruß. Cowboy, kleiner Sheriff, Hardliner an George Walker Bush, dem Präsidenten der Vereinigten Staaten, scheiden sich die Geister. Am Sonntag ist er jetzt 100 Tage im Amt und eins ist klar geworden, er will nicht everybody's darling sein. Die Amerikaner, denen scheint der Stil von Bush zu gefallen. Sie geben ihm überwiegend gute Noten und das nicht nur für seine Innen-, sondern auch für seine aus unserer Sicht umstrittene Außenpolitik. China, das war die erste Bewährungsprobe. George W. hat sie aus Sicht der Amerikaner bestanden. Statt Hohn kriegt der Mann mittlerweile jede Menge Respekt, auch wenn der Weg an die Macht aus unserer Sicht mehr als bizarr war. Eines hat George W. Bush schon jetzt geschafft. Er ist der erste Präsident, dem eine eigene Comedy-Show gewidmet ist. Seine peinlichen Versprecher und seine demonstrative Unlust, sich mit politischen Details zu quälen, sind ein gefundenes Fressen. Und die Lacher sind garantiert, wenn der Pseudo-Busch mit Frau Laura im Chor seufzt. Es ist viel schwerer, Präsident zu sein, als du dir vorstellen kannst. In der Tat, wann immer der echte Präsident vor die Kameras tritt, halten Freund und Feind den Atem an. Zum 100-Tage-Jubiläum verspricht der Taiwan mal eben den vollen militärischen Schutz der USA und wirft damit eine jahrzehntelange Politik über den Haufen. Versprecher oder Absicht? Bei Bush weiß man das nicht. Dabei hatte der außenpolitische Novize doch gerade in Sachen China viel Lob bekommen. Für das Vorgehen in der Affäre um das amerikanische Spionageflugzeug. Jetzt steckt er mit beiden Füßen im Fettnapf. Dass er bisher ohne die ganz großen Pannen über die Runden kam, verdankt der Amateur aus Texas seinem Kabinett, das überwiegend aus erfahrenen Veteranen des Kalten Krieges besteht. Der Preis... Eine Politik am äußersten rechten Rand. Es ist derartig konservativ. Ich glaube, das ist dann ziemlich deutlich. Aufgrund von der Benennung von gewisse Kabinettsposten. Das sieht man. Und ich glaube, was auch das oder wie das umgesetzt wird in der Politik, das muss man noch abwarten. Am deutlichsten wird die konservative Handschrift bisher in der Umweltpolitik. Die brüske Absage an das internationale Kyoto-Protokoll und Zugeständnisse an die Großindustrie haben Europäer und Umweltverbände im eigenen Land auf die Barrikaden gebracht. Erstaunlich zielstrebig hat der Präsident gegenüber dem Kongress die versprochenen Steuersenkungen in Billionenhöhe angepackt. Hier wirkt seine erfolgreichste Waffe. Der freundliche Mann an der Spitze wird ständig unterschätzt, während die mächtigen Strippenzieher im Hintergrund die Mehrheiten für die Wende nach rechts organisieren. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you have to admit, in my sentences, I go where no man has gone before. 
But the way I see it is I am a boon to the English language. I've coined new words, like misunderestimate <laughs> and hispanically. I've expanded the definition of words themselves, using vulcanize when I met polarize, <laughs> Grecians when I met Greeks, inebriating when I met exhilarating. <laughs> And instead of barriers and tariffs, I said terriers and barriffs. <laughs> we all make our contributions in the world, and I suppose mine will not be to the literary treasures of the Western civilization. <laughs> But I do hope to contribute in my own way. This is my actual first grade report card. <laughs> Up top it says, George W. Bush. <laughs> And then notice the final grades on the right. Writing A, reading A, spelling A, arithmetic A, music A, art A. So my advice is, don't peak too early. <laughs> Here I am with my fifth grade science project. <laughs> Built it myself. <laughs> And it's still meeting our energy needs. <laughs> If the vote recount left any hard feelings between my brother Jeb and me. Not a bit. In fact, here's a picture of the governor of Florida. <laughs> After graduation, I joined the Texas Air National Guard. I'm the one who committed the state of Texas to defend Taiwan from attack. <laughs> Dad? Neil, Darrow, Marvin, and Jeb. In my family, with all those kids in the tub, it's not arsenic in the water I'd be worried about. And now Martin Jeans will show us some pictures, some weather pictures, that is. <laughs> right, Martin? Hi, Octavia. In fact, yes, we're going to start in the United States, and we have the satellite to show you. And I think, I did mention 24 hours ago, I thought we were going to see some rain in southern Florida, and it's going to come true, I think, because we can already see the clouds moving into that region, and I think certainly by Sunday evening, there we are, there's all the blues, we will see some rain into that region that really needs the rain so badly, Florida, as that drought continues there. Elsewhere across the U.S., as we head through the midweekend, we'll see fine, warm conditions across the south, and indeed fine conditions in the Midwest and the Northeast, if not a touch cool. We will watch this cold front as it begins to move across the country into Monday because it could spark up a few thunderstorms, particularly, I think, across the northern plains. We'll see some more showers out there in the northwest, the Pacific Northwest, and snow over the higher elevations. California looking for dry conditions and some pleasant temperatures as well. L.A. looking at 24. Aber Vorsicht, nicht, dass ich nachher auf dem Melmark lande oder sowas. Hauptsache, bitte genau. Hauptsache, du bist weg. Jetzt hör mal auf zu sappeln. Es geht los. Da hat Pamela aber diesmal gut gezielt. Genau das ist sie, die Raumstation Mir. Und dort drinnen warten schon zwei ganz besondere Gäste auf uns. Kommt mal mit. Und zwar sind das zwei echte Astronauten, die auf der Mir waren. Hier sind Sergei Avdeyev aus Russland und Reinhold Ewald aus Deutschland. Hallo, herzlich willkommen bei uns. Hallo Dennis. Sergei, du bist Rekordhalter. Über 700 Tage warst du oben im All. Wann war das genau? Das war in den Jahren 1992, 95 und 98. Insgesamt war ich 748 Tage im All. Das heißt zwei Jahre und zwei Wochen. Und Reinhold, wie lange warst du oben in der Mir? Ich war nicht so lange da, nur 21 Tage im Jahre 1997 mit vier Russen zusammen und einem Amerikaner. Und wie das damals in der Mir angefangen hat, das zeigen wir euch jetzt mal. Die Mir Raumstation ist ja seit 1986 im All zusammengebaut worden. Das heißt, alle Einzelteile sind ineinander gesteckt worden, so wie man Lego-Bausteine zusammensteckt. Die großen Module sind nach und nach dazugekommen und schließlich hatte sie eine Größe. Naja, wenn man sie in ein Hallenbad, in ein geräumiges Hallenbad packt, da hätte sie reingepasst. Im Innen drin ist natürlich äh, vieles an den Wänden befestigt, was sonst wegfliegen würde. Äh, sehr verwirrend. Erstmal, wenn man als Neuling da reinkommt, man muss sich dann umschauen. 
Im Jahr 1995 haben wir zusammen mit Thomas Reiter im Weltall im offenen All gearbeitet, um kosmischen Staub von den vorbeifliegenden Kometen einzufangen und zu sammeln. Weiter zeigen die Bilder, wie Thomas Reiter mit dem Sammelapparat arbeitet. Die Experimente im Inneren, die befassen sich damit, wie denn der menschliche Körper auf die Schwerelosigkeit reagiert. Man muss sich dazu Blut abnehmen, viele äh, Daten erheben, um diese Reaktion festzuhalten. Haare schneiden im All mit dem Staubsauger. Und auch das Salto schlagen, das will erst gelernt sein. Nach ein paar Tagen im All geht das aber schon ganz gut. Das Essen wird in Paketen hier hochgebracht und oben am Bord warm gemacht. Es fliegt wie im Schlaraffenland einem in den Mund. Es ist so schön, sich zu duschen oder in die Sauna zu gehen. Sonst wird die Hygiene eigentlich eher klein geschrieben. Es gibt kein fließendes Wasser. Der Schlafsack wird irgendwo festgebunden. Und dann für die Nacht schläft man, ohne wegzuschweben. Essen haben wir eben im Film gesehen. Ihr habt auch ein bisschen was mitgebracht. Sergej, was stand auf eurem Speiseplan denn drauf? Es gibt verschiedene Lebensmittel an Bord. Meistens ist das trockenes Pulver ohne Wasser. Zum Zubereiten muss man die Tüte aufschneiden und mit Wasser auffüllen. Es gibt auch Konserven an Bord. Hier zum Beispiel eine Fischkonserve. Oh, halte mal gerade. Konserve, die also warm gemacht werden hier im Ofen oder Tuben. Und die Tuben. Die im All waren, die erkennt man daran, der Deckel ist angebunden, damit er nicht in der Schwerelosigkeit wegfliegt. Ja. Sergej, du warst ja jetzt am längsten da oben. Was meinst du, wie lange kann man es da maximal aushalten und vor allem, was macht man danach? Also mein längster Aufenthalt im All war ein Jahr und zwei Wochen. Es gab Kosmonauten, die noch länger dort waren, aber man muss wissen, dass man nach dem Flug unbedingt Zeit braucht, um wieder fit zu werden. Genauso lange, wie man im All war. Und Reinhard, was habt ihr jetzt da oben gelernt in dem Mir? Zuerst mal muss man lernen, in einer Mannschaft zusammenzuarbeiten, auch über verschiedene Sprachen natürlich äh, sich zu verständigen. Dann muss man lernen, mit dem Bodenkontrollzentrum, also mit der Erde, auch in guter Zusammenarbeit zu sein, denn die geben die entscheidenden Tipps. Und wenn das mal nicht möglich ist, keine Radioverbindung, auch schnell zu reagieren. Mhm. Da gab es nämlich mal einen Zwischenfall bei dir mit so einem Teil hier. Ja, das ist eine Sauerstoffpatrone, die entwickelt also Sauerstoff, äh, den wir atmen. Und diese Patrone ist uns explodiert, die wird in einem solchen Generator hier zum Laufen gebracht. Wir hatten dann äh, das Feuer zu löschen, wir waren in Gasmasken und warteten anderthalb, zwei Stunden, äh, bis die Luft wieder reine war, bis wir den Qualm und den Rauch von diesem Feuer aus der Station wieder raus hatten. Das ist Gott sei Dank gut gegangen. Was macht ihr jetzt da oben, wenn euch mal so richtig langweilig ist? Man kann ja nicht vor die Tür gehen. Nee, allerdings nicht. Also es gibt Kassetten an Bord, Musikkassetten. Es gibt äh, auch Filme, Videofilme, die die Kosmonauten sich bei langen Flügen anschauen. Sie haben auch Bücher dabei. Die Erde ist natürlich auch immer wieder schön anzuschauen. Aber man muss sich auch vorher darauf vorbereiten, das wird ein langer Flug. Ja, und dann ging es ja leider mit der Mir zu Ende. Und das wollen wir euch natürlich auch zeigen, das sah so aus. Das ist das Zentrum für die Astronautenflüge. Beim Eintritt der Raumstation Mir in die Atmosphäre war ich in der Nähe. Das war in der Nähe der Fidschi-Insel. Was hast du dabei empfunden, als dein altes Zuhause jetzt im Meer versenkt wurde? Es war traurig, die Station, in der ich zwei Jahre gelebt habe, so untergehen zu sehen. Und du, Reinhold? Nun, die Mürre ist ja nicht ganz verloren. Äh, in der äh, internationalen Raumstation lebt ja die Erfahrung weiter, das ist uns auch wichtig. Mhm. Sind dann schon wieder Sachen geplant? Werdet ihr wieder hochgehen ins All? Also momentan arbeiten Amerikaner, Russen, Japaner, Europäer zusammen. Und äh, so wird auch dann irgendwann, wenn Wissenschaft da an Bord gemacht wird, einer von uns äh, mit von der Partie sein. Sergej, gibt es eigentlich so einen Astronautengruß? So was wie mir nix, dir nix oder so? Was hat er gesagt? Weiche Landung natürlich. Das wünschen wir euch auf jeden Fall auch. Dankeschön, dass ihr bei uns zu Gast wart.
Endeavor with Buckaroo. The fancy guitar picking is by Don Kane from Dubuque, Iowa, senior to our famous Ascent flight director Leroy Kane. And appropriately, this is dedicated to all the flight controllers on both teams who have been picking at the CNC MDM for the last couple of days. Hey, good morning, Houston. Thank you for that extremely appropriate wake up music. In, uh our congrats to uh, Leroy and all the flight controllers that have been working so hard. Yeah, Rommel, just to give you a heads up, uh, with the loading of the software, the operation software for GNC MDM-3, we're now on load 92 of 144. And uh, with that, uh, the planning team is going home. And uh, I hope that we've left you in a little better shape than yesterday. Well, please pass on to the planning team. Uh, awesome job. We're real excited about today, and obviously the great job you did overnight. You guys get some good sleep. It's well deserved. Endeavor Houston, um, we're going to go outside with the cameras now and start setting up the camera views for reboost while we have KU. If we run out of time on the ground, we'll let you know and and uh, give you a heads up so that you can complete the camera setup. That's great, Houston. Appreciate it. The crew, uh, in addition to the steps of being uh, taken by Jim Voss, uh, working at a laptop computer on board at present, and other activities that will be performed by them today uh, related to the plans to recover a uh, all of the computers on board the station. One other activity will be a swap of computers, swapping a backup payload computer with one of the station's command and control computers. Uh, that uh, one command and control computer uh, is thought to have a failed hard drive, essentially, uh, that uh, a swap with a backup payload computer, which isn't being used on board the station at present, uh, would correct. Of the station's three command and control computers. One is uh, functioning well, again, uh, synchronizing with uh, most of the station's uh, secondary computer systems. Uh, that uh, one step in progress now to also synchronize the guidance, navigation, and control computer for the station with that primary command and control computer. Again, that's functioning well. The other two command and control computers are offline. This is a uh, live television from the cockpit of Endeavour. Astronaut uh, Scott Perzinski and uh, John Phillips uh, just moving out of view in the background, pilot Jeff Ashby, and uh, in the commander's seat on the left-hand side of the cockpit, Commander Kent Rominger, preparing to start a reboost. Again, uh, about an hour-long firing of the shuttle steering jets that will increase the altitude of the station by about two and a half statute miles. 
Uh, you can also on the big loop, uh, we have completed the uh, MPLM uh, deactivation and uh, the um, GMT we disabled, the, we empowered the ETHOS was uh, 117, 10 hours, 58 minutes, 49 seconds. We got it. managers uh, for the space shuttle program and space station program decided yesterday to extend Endeavour's mission by one day. Uh, that will have the shuttle remain docked to the station until Sunday with a landing on Tuesday. Uh, further extension of the mission also may be considered. And that's it for now and we'll let you know on CNC1 as soon as we get more words for you. Okay, thanks a lot for the update. We appreciate y'all doing that extra work to give us a big picture heads up that uh, it was good for us to have the situational awareness. Thanks. And Jim, it helps us too to put everything together. And if you'd like, we will continue giving these, you these statuses throughout the day. Yeah, please do. And we'll continue to ask questions. We're always confused, but uh, it helps us a whole lot when you guys uh, give us these explanations, and it's very educational for us. We really like to know what's going on with the station, and we're all learning a whole lot while we recover from these problems. Thank you. Uh, all activities are uh, approaching uh, the detachment of Raffaello from the station this afternoon, uh, that uh, then being berthed back into the payload bay of Endeavour uh, by astronaut Scott Perzinski operating the shuttle's robotic arm. That's the main uh, highlight uh, for the cruise activities for the remainder of the day, in addition to some transfer of equipment and supplies uh, from the shuttle, uh, moving equipment uh, from the shuttle's crew cabin to the station now after having uh, closed out uh, Raffaello this morning, closing the hatch on the Raffaello for the final time in the early hours this morning, Houston time. Flight controllers in the International Space Station control room continue to work with the computer problems that have been uh, experienced for the last couple of days on board. We're in a much better configuration today than uh, had been yesterday at this time with uh, one of the command and control computers in the Destiny Laboratory module fully functional again. Uh, the, uh, in order to have the capability to safely drive the common berthing mechanism uh, devices that will unlatch Raffaello from the Unity module. Uh, the flight controllers would like to have a backup system available and they have moved an early portable computer system uh, to the space right next to the common berthing mechanism in the Unity module so that it's quickly available should there become any problems with the command and control computer that will be controlling the uh, driving of the 16 powered bolts that are used to separate or lock together the Raffaello multipurpose logistics module and the Unity module. Endeavour Houston, we're ready for grapple. And the opcode looks good. All right, here we go. This is Mission Control Houston. Uh, we can see this sequential still video picture of the uh, shuttle's robot arm as it begins to be maneuvered into position to grapple the Raffaello multi-purpose logistics module. Endeavour and Alpha Houston on the big loop. We're ready to go to MPLM grapple. Alpha copies. And Endeavour copies. This is Miss Control Houston. We're now getting downlink television pictures as the space shuttle's robotic arm uh, inches its way toward the grapple fixture on the Raffaello multi-purpose logistics module. All this occurring as the shuttle and station orbit 238 statute miles above the Earth's surface uh, over the Pacific Ocean, uh, just about to cross over the equator. And now we're receiving a close-up view from the wrist camera on the shuttle's robotic arm as the end effector nears the grapple fixture on the Raffaello module.
Robotic arm operator Scott Perzinski and Umberto Guidoni. Now moving the shuttle's robotic arm in closer to the grapple fixture on the Rafael module. Endeavor for Peter S. Rafael is grappled, and just to uh, let you know, we've uh, taken a look from the lab, and it appears to be the uh, port uh, side mid tail bay light. And we've uh, powered that off, and we're putting a booty on top of it. Nice work, Scott. Good grapple, and thanks for the words on the lights. Sorry for the interruption. Oh, no problem. Okay, I have the procedure. I'm looking through it. Okay, uh, copy that. After you've had a chance to look through it a little, little bit, I had a few points of clarification. Uh, I'll let you get a chance to, uh, to get familiar with it first. Okay. This is Mission Control Houston. This view of the Raffaello module attached to the International Space Station and now grappled by the Space Shuttle's robotic arm uh, as the shuttle and station orbit 251 miles over the North Atlantic heading for the western coast of Portugal. This view is coming from a keel camera in the uh, bottom of the payload bay of the Space Shuttle. This is a location that the multipurpose logistics module known as Rafaela will soon be birthed to after it is uh, released from its common berthing mechanism moorings to the Unity module on board the International Space Station. Alpha Endeavor, this is Alpha. Houston on the Big Loop. Houston on the Big Loop. Alpha's here. Endeavor's here. Susan, John, we just uh, completed a nominal Node 1 Nader CBM prep for DMATE, and uh, John, you now have a go for the Nader CBM DMATE procedure. Uh, roger that, Dan. Steps 1 through 3 are complete. We're putting step 4, that's elbow, in work. Okay, copy that. We're following along. We're following along. And Alpha copies. This is Mission Control Houston with that. Uh, Mission Specialist John Phillips on board the International Space Station, the Space Shuttle Endeavor, given the go-ahead to begin driving the powered bolts that will begin disconnecting the Rafaela module from the International Space Station's Unity module. That call being voiced up by spacecraft communicator Dan Burbank from the International Space Station Flight Control at 2.25 p.m. Central Time. Okay, John, we copy that. Thanks for the update. Mission Specialist John Phillips on board the Space Shuttle Endeavour and International Space Station reporting that he's completed the final steps of uh, releasing the latches uh, for the common berthing mechanism that are connecting the Raffaello cargo transfer module to the unity module of the International Space Station. Scott Perzinski and Umberto Guidoni on board the shuttle have uh, put the shuttle's robotic arm in the proper mode to move it away from the unity module.
This is Mission Control Houston. The payload deployment and retrieval systems officer reports the arm is in motion. Scott Parazinski with help from Umberto Guidoni. Now moving Raffaello away from the unity module of the International Space Station. This is Mission Control Houston. The payload deployment retrieval system officer reports that the Raffaello module is now in what is known as the pre-install position. That's a, a reference to the installation procedure here in the uh, removal procedure. That means that the Raffaello module is being held off uh, about a foot away from the unity module. This is Mission Control Houston as the Space Shuttle Endeavor and the International Space Station move into darkness over the Sahara Desert. The Earth's limb in view behind the widening gap between the Raffaello Multipurpose Logistics Module and the Unity Module's Common Birthing Mechanism hatch. This is Mission Control Houston as we take a look at the Raffaello Multipurpose Logistics Module from a different keel cam camera location. The payload deployment retrieval systems officer reports that the uh, Raffaello module is now in the low hover position, being uh, held steady over the payload bay before being rebirthed to its payload retention latches. Endeavor for PDRS. We've got uh, Raffaello in the bay, and we're pressing on to ROU mate. We copy and concur. Raffaella in the bay, and moving on to ROU mate. Moving on to ROU mate. Right, so I surprised. 
foot cross volcanoes full of lava. I'd even grab a tiger by the tail. I would make fun of the boxing champion's mother. But my courage and my bowels both would fail. I would bite off a bunch of angry cosmos. I would stop a thousand bullets with my hand. I would laugh as my leg was amputated. But maybe I'm not that kind of man. Cause it's good to hate I do speak words, but I never do the deed. It's a Good morning, Endeavor. Dangerous by Set Cheese, chosen by Elena. And Chris, I guess the title refers to your job, but I really think it means that we have the greatest job. Have a great flight day 10. Hey, good morning, Steve. <laughs> yeah, we're having a good time up here. The arrogant worm is what a way to wake up. We're looking forward to this flight day and getting the uh, space flight pallet handed off. Yeah, it's that time of day again where you guys are just starting a great day and uh, we're finishing a tough one. So we're handing you over to Ellen and uh, Phil, and the next voice you will hear will be Ellen. Steve, uh, you know just how much work you guys are doing. I worked there in your seat for a lot of years, and it is a tremendous amount of work that gets done overnight to put together a clean slate for us up here every day, and we sure do appreciate it. Thanks a lot for the evening's work, and uh, we'll look forward to talking to you again tomorrow morning. And thanks for the wake-up music. You're welcome, and uh, I wish you the best with those CNC MDMs. For the big picture, uh, we still do not have CNC-1 and CNC-3. We've been uh, trying to load CNC-3 several times unsuccessfully. Um, a recent development, we think we found uh, an error in uh, some of the files, and maybe that will solve the problem. But um, on the side, we are also discussing the possibility of beginning robotic operations without getting another CNC. Uh, we're looking at the possible the loads associated with the uh, shuttle undocking and the Soyuz docking in various configurations if there was a failure. Uh, but we are probably going to need to wait uh, for the MMT decision a little bit later here to get a final decision on that if we don't get a CNC before that. So we can expect to not start our robotics operations until after the MMT makes the decision, Lisa? Unless we get a CNC before then, that is correct. As uh, was reported to the crew uh, this morning, uh, the Soyuz launched uh, successfully. Uh, that, uh, without problems, uh, the Soyuz spacecraft now uh, in orbit that uh, a replacement for the uh, emergency crew return vehicle uh, Soyuz that is currently attached uh, to the aft end of the station's Vesda module. This is a view now, a live television view of the shuttle's robotic arm as uh, the arm is maneuvered into position for a calibration of the space vision system. That's an alignment aid that's used with the arm uh, to help precisely align large modules as they're attached to the station. The uh, space vision system uses the uh, dots seen in this view on the exterior of the uh, mating adapter and the destiny module that can be seen. Uses uh, similar dots that will be on an airlock module, an airlock that is to be attached to the station on the next flight, uh, next shuttle flight bound for the complex, that to launch in June. This uh, calibration of the vision system underway at present on board that uh, will involve both uh, the space vision system on the shuttle and a counterpart system on the station, uh, gathering data and uh, information that will be useful in preparations and for that to next shuttle flight. Again, a uh, plan for launch in June and the attachment of an airlock that's planned during that flight. An Alpha Houston with an update on the C and C status. We are doing the reload for C and C3 now. Alpha copies, and we wish you good luck. Thanks. We have good news for you. We got a frame count on CNC3 and sync. Frame count on CNC3 and sync. Well, that sounds good. We think so. We think 
themselves. Now, for the rest of the world, other than all of the computer folks, is that like real good? Like, is that the final step that it's showing that it is working properly? It is definitely a step in the right direction. We're not finished with all our steps, but things are looking good right now. Alpha Houston on the big loop for CNC status. Very good news, CNC3 is successfully in backup. CNC2 is in primary. We're still having uh, the MSD inaccessible problem, but we're working on that right now. You said alpha copies. Nice work down there. Thanks. We'll see if we can keep them operating. Thanks. We'll see if we can keep them operating. Did that call to uh, the Expedition 2 crew on the station that uh, there are now two good computer systems on board the station, a primary computer system and a backup computer system. Although, uh, just about uh, 45 minutes ago, just as uh, the activities with the backup computer to bring it online were uh, reaching a conclusion, a load of software in that computer uh, completing and uh, the control team going through the steps to bring that one online, uh, the primary computer did have an error message uh, that indicated a problem in accessing its uh, memory storage device, uh, essentially its a uh, hard drive. Um, that, uh, however, message is still being evaluated by the ground as to uh, just uh, what its implications are. So uh, that uh, message still uh, not understood by flight controllers and an evaluation of that message ongoing. The primary computer, though, continues to function well in controlling the station systems and communicating with the ground uh, with uh, no problems uh, seen. Alpha Houston for Susan. Okay, uh, we're about a half an hour away, I think, right now from beginning. And uh, based on uh, the necessity to get the robotics operations done, the crew conference is going to be deferred um, probably till tomorrow morning. We'll have more words on that a little bit later. Regarding the robotics ops, uh, right now we still do not have the MSD back on CNC2. We have some concerns about that, and uh, we may be in a position here shortly. We'll have some more words and specifics, but in pressing ahead with robotics ops without the MSD, and that's got some implications because PCS commanding for you won't be an option. We'll be covering all those steps here on the ground. It'll require a lot more coordination between us, but uh, we think that's probably where we're headed right now. More words to follow. Okay, Dan, thanks for the big picture, and uh, we won't even think about the press conference then, uh, unless it turns out robotics is just not going to be happening, you know, sometime in the next couple hours. And I'm glad that you gave us the big picture on that. I'll pass the word around. Okay, that's great. And again, we'll give you the details here shortly. We're still sorting those out. Okay. This is Mission Control Houston with that uh, spacecraft communicator Dan Burbank in the International Space Station Flight Control Room, letting Susan Helms on board the International Space Station uh, know that uh, we're pretty sure we're going to defer today's planned crew news conference, which had been scheduled for 1.41 p.m. Central Time uh, until a little bit later, uh, possibly tomorrow morning before the uh, shuttle undocks from the International Space Station. Uh, because we're about one half an hour away, he thinks, from beginning these Space Lab pallet handoff maneuvers with the two robotic arms. Meanwhile, on the International Space Station side, uh, Flight engineers Susan Helms and Jim Voss standing by to operate the station's robotic arm, the newly delivered arm named Kennedy Arm 2. A longer, stronger, more capable arm than the original shuttle robotic arm with more degrees of freedom. and the unique ability to walk around the International Space Station using its uh, two hands or latching end effectors. The Space Lab pallet carried Canadarm2 into orbit aboard the Space Shuttle's cargo bay and was used as the initial installation tool to set it up on the side of the Destiny Laboratory module. After the uh, shuttle robotic arm made its successful walk-off and grappled another 
power and data grapple fixture on the other side of the Destiny Laboratory module. The Space Lab pallet was removed from its lab cradle assembly and has since been holding the Space Lab pallet away from the space station exterior. On the shuttle side, Scott Perzinski and Chris Hadfield with Chris Hadfield on the lead operating the space shuttle's robotic arm. They've already moved it uh, past the pre-cradle position and into the viewing position for this uninstall procedure. The next step will be to maneuver the space station Canada Arm 2 robotic arm to the handoff position. This is Mission Control Houston as we continue to receive downlink pictures from on board the Space Shuttle Endeavour's cameras looking up at the Canada Arm 2 as it grips the Space Lab pallet. The robotics officer in the International Space Station Flight Control Room reports he is go to begin single joint operations, moving each joint of the Canada Arm 2 independently to put the Space Lab pallet into the proper position for grapple by the shuttle robotic arm. This is Mission Control Houston with uh, Jim Voss now ready to begin driving the Canada Arm 2 for the first time. The robotics officer confirms the arm is in motion at 3.01 p.m. Central Time. The shuttle and station orbiting 240 statute miles over the just to the northeast of Australia. Houston, we're seeing correct motion up here physically. Copy, and uh, we see good numbers on the ground. Copy, and uh, we see good numbers on the ground. As we do up here. Okay, we're going in a negative direction to negative 181 decimal 1, and we're starting motion now. Jim Voss keeping very close control, coordination with the International Space Station Flight Control Team on the ground as they continue to move the space station's robotic arm, which is holding a space lab pallet, into the position where it can be grappled by the space shuttle robotic arm. These views of Canada Arm 2 in action coming from the Space Shuttle Endeavour's payload bay cameras. Flight engineers Jim Voss and Susan Helms working together with the International Space Station flight controllers on the ground to coordinate the movements of the robotic arm. SLP is coming to you from the back side of the lab from our camera B view and it's looking good. Jim, we copy that. So it looks great to us too. Uh, we're about a minute and a half out from a handover. Okay, we copy that. You want us to continue this move? Yes, please. We'd like you to go ahead and complete this uh, particular maneuver. Uh, we don't anticipate it'll be a long uh, handover. Okay, we'll continue this and we'll stop at minus 181.1 and make sure we've got calm before we go on. Can we see risk roll selected? You have a go to maneuver risk uh, roll to positive 76. Okay, we're going in a negative direction to a plus 76 in risk roll. And we're initiating motion now. We can go.
This is Mission Control Houston International Space Station flight engineers Jim Voss and Susan Helms in progress of moving the space station's new Canadian-built robotic arm away from the Destiny Laboratory module into a location where the shuttle's robotic arm can grapple another grapple fixture on the Space Lab pallet. Endeavour Alpha Houston, we see a good group pre grapple position. We have grappled, we have limped the arm, and we're just finishing up the procedure now. We copy and concur. We copy and concur. This is Mission Control Houston, Chris Hadfield aboard the International Space Station and Space Shuttle Endeavour, actually on the aft flight deck of Endeavour, reporting that uh, grapple is complete, that uh, the Grapple fixture has been captured by the snares in the robotic arm, and the arm has been rigidized. This is Mission Control Houston. These television pictures uh, on orbit at an altitude of 238 statute miles, showing on the left the Destiny Laboratory module with the station robotic arm, Kennet Arm 2, connected to its power and data grapple fixture, and on the right, just passing out of this picture, the shuttle Canadian ro built robot arm. Mark. Copy. On the ground, we see standby. Copy. And uh, pitch plane, we're ready. What a beautiful piece of hardware. This is Mission Control Houston, uh, Flight Engineer Susan Helms on the International Space Station uh, moving the Space Station robotic arm, Kennet Arm 2, uh, away from its uh, to provide sufficient clearance for the shuttle robotic arm to follow up the station's arms with its own set of maneuvers to take the Space Lab pallet back into the shuttle's payload bay. Canadian astronaut who is uh, now slowly moving the Space Lab pallet away from the shuttle's arms, newer, longer, tougher cousin.